My name's Zeldin, and you wouldn't believe the crap I saw out in northern Arizona a couple of summers back. Me and my buddies, Reese and Kellen, were on a road trip, trying to squeeze in one last blast of stupidity before college started. Reese had this great uncle who left him a cabin near Flagstaff, so naturally, we decided to turn it into Party Central. Only, this wasn't some fancy lakefront property. Out there, it was all twisted pines and dry washes, the kind of place where you start to feel watched even when you're alone. Let me paint a picture for you. The cabin wasn't much to look at. It was this squat, single-story thing built from weathered cedar, a couple of sad windows facing the endless expanse of trees. Out back, there was an old fire pit that hadn't seen a flame in years, and a rambling path that wound its way into the dense woods. If I'd had any sense, we would have turned around the moment we pulled up. But at twenty, you think you're invincible. The first night was weird. It wasn't like full-on horror movie weird, just those subtle things that make you jumpy. See, out there the silence was absolute. Like, no bugs, no wind, just this heavy quiet that settled on you like a blanket. We got a fire going, cracked a few beers, and tried to ignore the creeping shadows at the edge of the light. Kellen swore he heard something moving out there a couple of times, but we figured it was deer or something. I mean, we were in a forest, nothing too crazy. Things got weirder the next day. Kellen's the outdoorsy type, always disappearing on hikes, so he was gone most of the afternoon. Me and Reese stayed back, planning to hit up the town for supplies when he returned. Only he never did. Sun was getting low, and there was still no sign of him. That's when the worry set in. Now Kellen knew his way around the woods, but this place had an unsettling feel to it. We tried his cell straight to voicemail. About an hour later, just as we were about to head out and look for him, Reese calls out, Dude, check this out. I find him near that old path, staring off into the trees. He points to a spot about fifty yards in, and my stomach drops. There's a flash of bright color against the dull browns of the undergrowth, something that definitely doesn't belong. It's Kellen's red backpack. I thought I heard voices, Reese says, his own voice barely a whisper. That way. We edge closer, the ground littered with broken pine cones and needles under our feet. As we near the backpack, dread clenches my gut. I've got a bad feeling about this. We creep forward, and that's when we see it, a spot of bare earth, scuffed and trampled. Kellen's backpack sits in the middle but there's no sign of him. And then there was the smell. I'll never forget it. A sickly sweet must that clogged the back of my throat, making me gag. Reese, white-faced, points to a smear on a nearby tree trunk, just above my head. It was dark, thick, and streaked down to the ground. Blood. Fresh blood. We didn't stop to think. We turned and ran. I stumbled, fell, scrambled up, the panic propelling me back towards the cabin, Reese hot on my heels. As we burst through the trees and back into the clearing, both of us slammed the cabin door shut and bolted it behind us. We stood there, panting, hearts thundering. What the hell was that? Reese gasps, leaning against the door. I shake my head, my mind racing. It was too dark now to head into town. We were stuck out there for the night, and we both knew something was lurking outside. All I could think about was that smell and the dark smear of blood. It didn't seem real, a nightmare playing out in the middle of nowhere. The woods rustled and crackled, surrounding us. We huddled around the fire pit out back, too scared to go inside. That night was endless every sound amplified a hundred times over. It wasn't just the rustling now, there were heavy thuds, 
like something big moving around the cabin, snuffling and scratching. A couple of times, I heard a rasping breath against the back window. I swear it sounded almost curious. It was just before dawn that it happened. Reese had nodded off, leaning against me, and I was blinking heavily, trying to stay awake. Then I saw it. A silhouette moving at the edge of the clearing, monstrously tall and lean, like a skeletal, deformed shadow hunched in the pre-dawn light. Its head twitched towards us, and in the dim glow, I saw them, its eyes. They were huge, oval, reflecting an unnatural blue in the half-light. Not animal eyes, something else entirely, intelligent and filled with an unsettling hunger. I screamed. Reese jolted awake, staring at me in confusion as I scrambled back, pointing. There! In the trees! Did you see it? Reese looked, scanning the tree line. See what, Eldon? It was gone, vanished back into the darkness. Reese blinks at me like I've grown a second head. Eldon, man, what the hell? Get some sleep, you're seeing things. My throat's raw. I swear, Reese, it was there huge, not like a bear or anything. And those eyes. I shudder. The image of those unnerving blue orbs burned into my memory. We huddle against the dying fire the rest of the night, taking turns in fitful half-dozes. The creature doesn't return, but the woods buzz with its absence, alive with a sense of menace that crawls under my skin. First light comes as a relief. We pack up fast, abandoning most of our gear in our haste. No way am I sticking around to find out what that thing wants. We stumble back to the car, every crackle and rustle making us jump. As I slam the door, something catches my eye, a ragged tear in the trunk's metal, like the car had been swiped with giant claws. Panic fuels me as I start the engine and throw the car into reverse. We tear out of there, barely stopping to shut the gate to the property behind us. We don't talk much on the drive, just stare ahead, trying to put as much distance between us and that place as possible. Every truck, every hitchhiker, makes us flinch. We don't stop until we hit the outskirts of Flagstaff, collapsing into a cheap, grimy motel, only then feeling safe enough to breathe. The news reports start a couple of days later. Missing hiker in the Coconino National Forest. They found his mutilated body near a campsite, the cause of death undetermined. They chalk it up to an animal attack, but I know better. It took everything in me not to call the cops, to tell them what I saw. Would they believe me? Would they even care? I imagine the laughter, the questions about how much we'd had to drink. No, better to keep my mouth shut and pretend like it was all a nightmare. But it wasn't a nightmare. News reports of similar attacks start popping up, scattered, isolated, victims torn apart the way only something with unnatural strength could do. The papers toss around theories, escaped zoo animal, deranged recluse, but none of it feels right. Me, I know the truth but I keep it locked away, a chilling secret I'll carry for the rest of my days. Years passed. I avoided forests like the plague, even the manicured city parks making me uneasy. The memory of that night never truly faded, but it dulled, tucked into a corner of my mind reserved for things I tried not to think about. I finished school, got a decent job, even started a family the picture of normalcy. Then a few weeks ago, I was on a work trip, flipping through channels in a bland hotel room when a news story stopped me cold. A rash of disappearances in northern Arizona, right near that godforsaken stretch of woods. They hadn't found any bodies this time, just abandoned campsites and blood-spattered trails disappearing into the forest. Authorities were baffled, Locals whispering stories about an old legend their grandparents used to tell. 
the skin bearer. That was what they called it in the local legends, a shape-shifting creature, gaunt and skeletal, with eyes that glowed an unnatural blue. Some say it was a cursed spirit. Others whispered about a demonic thing that lurked in the shadows. But one thing the tales agreed on. It craved only one thing human flesh. I turn off the TV, a cold sweat breaking out. It can't be a coincidence. It's back. All these years later, that thing is still out there, still hunting. And somewhere, deep down, I know it won't stop until it finishes what it started that night. My name's Eldon, and I live in a cabin I built myself outside a tiny town called Willow Creek, nestled deep in Vermont's mountains. Yeah, kinda cliché, the whole, off-the-grid, thing. Honestly, it wasn't about philosophy, it was about the property prices. Anyway, that September, I was splitting wood with my buddy Kian, before the worst freeze of winter set in. Dude, you hear that? Kian asked, the head of his splitting maul lifted. His usually goofy grin was replaced with a confused grimace. Hear what? I glanced up, listening. The wind, sighing through the trees, was a familiar sound. Same with the occasional caw of a crow circling overhead. Sounds like chanting? I dunno. He shrugged, bringing the maul down hard on a stubborn log. I rolled my eyes. You've been watching too many of those weird documentaries, man. Kian grinned, nudging me. Hey, keeps things interesting during long Vermont winters. We worked in companionable silence for a while. I wasn't the superstitious type, but after my ex left, the isolation out here could play tricks on my mind. Maybe that's what was happening to Kian. Then it came again. Not chanting this time, but a kind of rhythmic, thudding. It was offbeat, almost rhythmic. Uneasy, I dropped my axe. Do you hear that now? I asked Kian. He was already standing stock still, squinting into the trees. Yeah, what the hell is that? Sounds like it's coming from down by the creek. Kian gestured vaguely downhill. Stay here, I'll check it out. I said, feeling like it was my duty since it was my property. I didn't like the tremor in my own voice. Eldon, maybe we should just dash. Kian started, but I was already jogging away, grabbing my hunting rifle from the cabin porch on the fly. The woods were thick, and the rhythmic thuds, intermingled with rustling leaves and wind, were hard to follow. I almost tripped over a fallen log and swore, slowing down. Whatever it was, it wasn't moving fast. When I reached the creek bed, the noises grew clearer. Two or three distinct, heavy thumps followed by a dragging sound, then it repeated. Hello? Anyone there? I called out, keeping the rifle raised. No answer, just those damn disjointed thuds closer now. With a pounding heart, I rounded a bend in the creek. My breath hitched. There was a clearing ahead, and on the far side was something. I froze, trying to comprehend what I was seeing. It was massive, easily twice as tall as a man, hunched over a deer carcass. Fur, impossibly long and black, hung mangy from its bony frame, obscuring its face. Jesus! I breathed, slowly backing away. Each of its ungainly movements produced those grotesque thuds. My mind raced. Was it a bear, maybe? But no bear was that big, that skeletal. Then it lifted its head, and what I saw made me fumble the rifle. It wasn't a bear snout that emerged, but a horrifying parody of a human face stretched taut across a flat skull. Small, milky eyes blinked, and black saliva dripped from elongated teeth. It was utterly wrong, 
an abomination against nature. My brain stuttered, trying to find any reference point. Was it something from local legend? A deranged hermit, some mutated animal? Nothing fit. It took several steps, and my body finally kicked in. I whirled around, rifle clutched in sweaty hands, and ran. Behind me, I heard a sound like nothing I'd ever heard before, a wheezing howl laced with an eerie, almost human glee. Twigs snapped, and I risked a glance over my shoulder. It was gaining on me with alarming speed despite its awkward frame. I pushed harder, lungs burning, heart ready to burst. The woods ahead blurred into green and brown, my panic gasps the only sound in my ears. Just when it seemed my legs might give out, I saw the edge of my clearing. Kian stood there, splitting axe raised like a frozen warrior. His yell broke through the haze of terror. Eldon, what the hell is Dash? His voice cut off as the beast came lumbering from the tree line. Its long arms stretched out towards him, those horrific teeth. Kian didn't even look confused anymore, just stark white terror. I don't blame him. The thing was a nightmare made flesh. Gone! I yelled, knowing it was a foolish hope that the shock probably left him frozen. It shambled towards Kian, a jerky, unstoppable movement. There was no time. I raised the rifle and aimed for its center of mass the best I could. The first shot cracked the air, and the creature staggered back, for singed with a puff of smoke. A guttural screech echoed off the trees. Kian, jolted from his stupor, finally dropped the axe and turned to flee. He wasn't fast enough. The beast lunged, impossibly agile for such a lanky frame. Kian screamed, cut off as those massive, dirty claws raked his back. Blood arced like crimson ribbons through the air. He stumbled and fell, but somehow he was still scrabbling forward, leaving a grotesque trail behind him. I fired twice more, the echoes deafening after the silence of the woods. Each of my shots hit it, but it didn't slow down, just seemed to rage harder. I was running out of time. Dropping the rifle, I sprinted forward, bellowing a wordless animalistic cry in a voice I barely recognized as my own. The thing turned from Kien and swiped a claw at me. I managed to dodge the first blow, but the second caught me on the arm. Pain seared up to my shoulder. I hit the ground hard, gasping. Through blurry vision, I saw the creature loom over me. It leaned closer, those milky eyes fixated, the rancid, coppery smell of its breath making me heave. I was about to die just like Kian, just like that poor, ravaged deer. Something sharp sparked in my brain, a desperate survival instinct. With a roar that felt ripped from my gut, I scrambled backwards, kicking at the thing's leg. My boot thudded hard against bone. It screeched again, higher pitched, and reared back with that uncanny echo of human pain. Kian lay a few feet away, still alive but barely. Eldon, the cabin! He gasped, choking on blood. Then a flicker of movement in the tree line caught my eye. A woman, of all things, dressed in forest ranger gear emerged, brandishing a shotgun. I'd heard there were a few stationed in the area but help felt like it had arrived a lifetime too late. Get back! she yelled. The creature took one threatening step towards her, and she fired with a bone-shaking boom. It staggered but didn't fall. She fired again, this time aiming for its head. The skull exploded in a spray of black gore. The thing thrashed and then collapsed, its inhuman screams fading into bubbling rasping breaths. It became still, mercifully still. I slumped back, breath coming in harsh sobs. It was over, but my hands trembled. The ranger hurried to Kian, but it was clear one glance was enough. 
Her expression when she turned back to me was a mix of horror and grim pity. I wasn't arrested despite everything. The aftermath was a blur of statements, interviews, and then nauseating condolences for Kian's family. My cabin seemed tainted now, and I didn't know if I could stay. The whole town knew my name, whispered words like, creature, and monster, followed me. They called it the Goat Stalker, something dredged up from forgotten local folklore. Sometimes, in those restless nights haunted by Kian's screams and that thing's eyes, I think maybe that woman wasn't a ranger at all. Locals had stories about something guarding these woods, an old spirit taking vengeance on those who harmed the land. Who knows, maybe there was some truth to those old tales after all, and maybe it was the only thing that saved me. This happened to me on February 18, 2012. I'm Will Carter, search and rescue in Yellowstone National Park. Don't let the tourist crowds fool you. Those woods hold secrets the guidebooks won't mention. They whispered about something back then, locals did, called it. Well, never mind the name, don't want to put ideas in your head. That winter was brutal. Early snowfall the heavy kind that snaps branches and buries trails. We had our hands full, lost skiers, the occasional reckless hiker who thought they could beat the weather. Mostly routine stuff, thank goodness. Then came the call about the Simmons family. Experienced campers, Dad was ex-military. Hadn't shown up at their designated site, and a blizzard was rolling in. Felt a knot tighten in my gut right then. Time was of the essence. I partnered up with Maggie, sturdy gal, good head on her shoulders. We bundled up and headed out, following the Simmons' planned route, fighting through the thickening snow. It was slow going, the drifts already knee-high in some places. I shouted their names until my voice went hoarse. Only the howl of the wind answered back. Hours passed, the light failing. My worry was gnawing at me. Seasoned folks like that don't just disappear. Then Maggie yelled, her voice high-pitched. She was pointing, and I followed her gaze. Blood. A smear of it, dark against the pristine snow, leading off the trail. My heart jackhammered against my ribs. We followed the spatters my flashlight cutting through the gloom. They led us deeper into the woods, to a small clearing shrouded in shadows. That's when I saw the carnage. Their tent was shredded, supplies scattered like a whirlwind had torn through. Sleeping bags lay in bloody heaps. And, and there were bones. Cleaned of flesh. Human bones. Maggie vomited into the snow, a harsh, choking sound. I knelt by the remains, my mind reeling. Animal attack didn't fit. Too precise, too deliberate. That's when the fear, the icy, primal fear, hit me. We weren't alone. We heard it before we saw it. A growl, deep and guttural, that seemed to shake the very air. The trees at the clearing's edge parted, and the creature stepped into the dim light. Words fail me, even now. It was immense, easily twice the size of a bear, its fur matted and patchy. The limbs were elongated, the hands tipped with claws like butcher knives. But it was the head, that wolfish skull, those burning eyes that glowed an unnatural yellow in the darkness. I'll never forget those eyes. It stared at us, head tilted, a sickening intelligence flickering in its gaze. Maggie screamed and scrambled back, but I froze, my legs refusing to obey. The creature let out another growl, and then it charged. I snapped out of my trance. Run! I yelled at Maggie, pure terror fueling my voice. We turned and bolted, plunging back into the snow-choked woods. 
Behind us, the creature roared, its furious snarls whipping through the trees. We ran blindly, branches tearing at our faces, the snow muffling our panicked gasps for air. Trip, stumble, crawl to our feet and keep running. It was behind us, its snarls getting closer, the stench of its breath washing over us. Maggie shrieked. She'd fallen, twisted her ankle. Keep going, she cried, tears streaking her face. I hesitated, torn. But the creature was upon her, a hulking shadow against the snow. There was nothing I could do. Her scream cut off in a sickening gurgle. I ran. I ran like a cornered animal, every instinct screaming at me to survive. The creature didn't immediately follow, too busy with its gruesome feast, but its snarls stalked me through the night. I tripped over a fallen log, pain exploding in my shin. I didn't stop, scrambling up on pure adrenaline. The adrenaline crashed, left behind a throbbing leg and a despair so deep it threatened to swallow me whole. That's when I saw it, a distant flicker of light. The ranger station. I burst through those station doors a wild mess, babbling about the Simmons, Maggie, the creature in the woods. The rangers, bless them, they didn't doubt me. They rallied, armed search parties combing the woods, but they never found a trace of Maggie, or of those poor folks we'd been sent to rescue. They didn't find the creature either. Some called me crazy, traumatized. Let them. I don't care. I know what I saw, what lurks out there in the wild places. Some folks whispered that old name after, started carrying bigger guns, casting wary glances over their shoulders. Me? I still patrol the woods, I do my job. They needed me, more than ever. But on quiet nights, when the wind howls like a hungry beast, the hair prickles on the back of my neck. I see those burning yellow eyes in the darkness, filled with a terrible, ancient malice. The aftermath was a mess I didn't stick around to see. Official report? Animal attack, victims never recovered. Lies, but the clean kind, the kind meant to keep tourists calm and the donations flowing. Rangers were quietly given the real version, though. We watched the woods differently after that. A couple years later, I was on patrol, skirting the edge of that same stretch of forest where it had happened. Saw something move, a flash of patchy fur disappearing into the trees. Didn't get a good look. Could have been a bear, could have been my mind playing tricks. Then came the call. Missing hiker, last seen near that area. Found his campsite. Same scene as before. Shredded tent, blood, the works. But on a torn scrap of sleeping bag, a crude drawing was scrawled, and it chilled me to my core. Two stick figures, and a misshapen monster with blazing yellow eyes. Hiker never turned up. They blamed it on a grizzly. But I knew. Some whispers changed then, folks growing bolder, less afraid to give the beast a name. The name itched in my mind, a brand seared into memory. They called it the Skin Ripper. Apt if you asked me. It's been years. Seasons change, tourists come and go, and the woods seem the same as ever. But those of us who know, we walk those trails a bit heavier, our gaze is a tad warier. Cause that thing is still out there, I swear it. Sometimes, I imagine I feel its eyes on me, like a predator sizing up prey. I figure it's only a matter of time before the skin ripper finds a new victim. I just pray it ain't me. This happened to me a few years back, when I was still living in Montana. Big sky country, right? Gorgeous, but rugged. Me, I'm not the outdoors type, more into computers than campfires. But that summer, 
My buddy Tristan, he was obsessed with exploring all these old abandoned mines in the mountains. Finally talked me into going with him. My name's Jared, by the way. Figured I'd get that out of the way. So, we packed our gear, flashlights, ropes, the whole bit, and drove out to this place he'd found. It was a long trek from the highway, down a dirt road, then on a trail that basically disappeared into the trees. We reached the mine entrance around midday. It was dark, gaping hole in the hillside, a few rotting timbers propping it up. Gave me the creeps, but Tristan was practically bouncing with excitement. He insisted we head down right away. The first section of the mine was rough but navigable. Old tracks, piles of broken equipment, damp rock walls. Tristan, of course, had to start with all the stories about what could be lurking down there. Mountain lions, escaped convicts, who knew what. I just rolled my eyes. We went deeper, and the tunnel got narrower. Tristan was shining his light ahead, pointing out weird rock formations, going on about veins of ore. The air got thick and stale. My cell signal was long dead. That, finally, started getting to me a little. We reached a spot where the tunnel forked. Tristan chose the left path, but something stopped me. My phone flashlight wasn't the greatest, but there was enough light to pick something up, movement in the right-hand tunnel. A flicker of eyes, reflecting yellow, that seemed too big, too far apart. Then a growl, low and guttural. Tristan, wait! I started to back away. He glanced back, annoyed. What's up with you, man? Then he saw what I was looking at. The look on his face was priceless, that overconfident bravado gone in a second. The thing stepped out then. Shaggy, hunched, taller than a man should be. A massive head with a pronounced muzzle, filled with teeth way too long. Tristan let out a yelp, and we both spun to run. It charged with a speed that defied its size. I heard Tristan yell, a shriek cut short. I didn't look back. Just ran, crashing blindly through that narrow passage, the thing's snarls hot on my heels. I stumbled, hitting the wall, my flashlight flying from my hand. Plunged into utter darkness. I fumbled, feeling along the rocks, trying to keep going. Then, a light flickered ahead, Tristan's big, fancy one. He was crouched further on, looking back at me, face white. Keep moving, he shouted, and we took off again. I don't know how far we went, just that my chest hurt, my breath rasping. We burst into a larger chamber, moonlight spilling in through a hole in the ceiling. I stopped, panting, scanning wildly for an exit. No use. We were cornered. The thing stepped into the chamber, blocking the tunnel entrance. Its chest heaved, hot breath steaming. It eyed us, head tilting, seeming almost curious. Then, with another snarl, it lunged. Tristan pushed me back, yelled for me to run, and pulled out this huge freaking hunting knife he had. Completely insane to face that thing with a knife but braver than I'd ever be. The fight, if you can call it that, was short. There was a blur of motion, claws raking, the sickening sound of tearing, then just whimpers fading fast. I stood there, frozen, listening to my friend die. And when it was quiet, when only the thing's ragged breathing remained, that's when I finally bolted. I scrambled up the rock pile where the moonlight came through, squeezed out into the night. Ran blindly through the trees, back down the trail. Burst out onto the dirt road and sprinted until I collapsed. Didn't flag down a car until dawn broke. The cops came, of course. Searched the mine, but found nothing, no trace of Tristan. I went back to that place a few times with larger groups, armed guys. 
We never found a sign of the creature, nothing to explain what happened. Most people assume I made it up, or had some kind of breakdown out there. Honestly, I wish that was true. But I know what I saw. People don't vanish into thin air, and whatever killed Tristan, it wasn't any bear or wildcat I've ever seen. Some nights, I think I hear it outside my window. That same low growl. I keep telling myself it's probably a stray dog. But I also keep a loaded shotgun under my bed, just in case. My name is Lucas Hayes, and this happened to me on February 16, 2012. Bit more recent than some of the other stuff you've likely heard. I'm not the storytelling sort never was. Job doesn't really call for it, know what I mean. Bit of background, I'm CIA, but the fieldwork kind. Not like you see in the movies, more clean up, if that makes sense. The things that get swept under the rug real fast. The things that can't ever see the light of day. I thought I'd seen it all, but that was before the call came about Alaska. Little town up on the north slope, place called Akiagvik. They'd pulled something out of the ice while drilling. Not a body, not at first. Just chunks, scraps. Problem was, whatever it came from wasn't any creature science had ever documented. The panicked report mentioned scales the size of dinner plates, clawed appendages, and a stench that made the oil riggers wretch. It reeked of bad news. My partner on this mess was Amelia Ortiz, tough, level-headed, the kind of backup you pray for when things go sideways. We flew in under cover of an environmental contamination, scare, the usual. The town was on edge, all hushed whispers and wary glances. Nobody wanted to talk, least of all the drill foreman, a burly guy named Walt who looked like he'd wrestled a polar bear once. Just some damn weird fish, he grumbled, handing us a plastic wrapped chunk of meat. It was fibrous, the color of old blood. The smell hit me next, like rotten seaweed and something metallic. Amelia gagged, taking a step back. The hell is that? Like I said, fish? Walt wasn't looking at us, just staring at the horizon where the sea ice was already starting to crack. Bad time of year for it, but currents can bring up all sorts. The lie hung heavy in the frigid air. This wasn't a fish. It was something old, the reek of it resonating with a primal, wrong instinct in the back of my brain. We spent the next few days gathering samples, interviewing locals. Everyone kept to the same story, tight-lipped. Something was off about the whole town, a sense of coiled tension. Then came the blizzard. One of those that rolls off the Arctic, blotting out the sun. We were snowed in and in this tiny, isolated place, the feeling of being watched, hunted, grew unbearable. One night, hunkered down in a cabin, Amelia paced in front of the boarded-up windows. They know, she hissed. They all know what's out there. I wasn't ready to entertain the crazy theories yet, but the dread was sinking its claws into me too. Next morning, we went looking for answers on the outskirts of town. Found an old Inuit woman, bundled in furs on her porch. She looked a hundred, and her eyes held a wisdom that made me feel like an ant under a magnifying glass. The Aptina whispers your names in the wind, she rasped, her voice barely louder than the snow. Old one stirs beneath the ice. You should go. Aptina. Amelia started, but the old woman waved a dismissive hand. Old stories for children to learn their place. She cackled then, like dry leaves, and focused on me. But you, you see, don't you? Hiding in the shadows, just beyond your sight. 
The hair on my neck was standing on end. Had she guessed our purpose? Or was she talking about something else? Before we could ask, a scream echoed from the direction of the town. We exchanged grim looks and ran. What we found was chaos. Buildings torn open, blood smeared across the snow, but no bodies. We skidded to a halt by the shoreline and witnessed a sight that still haunts my dreams. Chunks of ice were breaking off, driven by something colossal surging up from the depths. Out of the churning, black water rose, it. At first glimpse, my panicked mind screamed, Snake, but that was wrong. This was like a serpent had been crossed with a squid, scaled tentacles writhing, multiple eyes gleaming with cold intelligence. It dwarfed the fishing boats, bobbing helplessly in its wake. Walt stood at the shoreline, not running, an axe in his hands. He roared a wordless challenge, and the Uptina, if that's what it truly was, snatched him up. Walt swung his axe in a feudal arc before disappearing down the creature's gaping maw. Amelia shouted something, but I barely heard her over the roar of the wind and the blood pounding in my ears. I fumbled for my gun, but what use is a pistol against something like that? Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature submerged, leaving only broken ice and the bitter tang of sea water in the air. The whole town had seen the attack, yet as we stumbled back toward those rough shacks, people averted their eyes, muttering apologies. Amelia wanted to stay, to investigate, to do something. I overruled her. The CIA might want containment, but I knew, deep down, that some things can't be contained. We radioed for evac, fabricated a story about rogue polar bear attacks to explain the carnage and got the hell out of Utkiagvik. The official report was, of course, a cover-up. Nothing unusual found, drilling operations to continue as normal. Like hell they would. The locals know, and I sure as hell know, that the Actina is still out there. Some nights I think I can smell that rotten seaweed stink even here, down in Virginia. Makes me wonder, has that thing learned? Is it waiting? And if it decides to surface somewhere less remote than the Arctic, what in God's name will we do? My name is Malachi Brooks, and this happened to me on July 22, 2009. Been a park ranger all my life just like my granddad before me. We take pride in protecting Yellowstone National Park, those wide-open spaces, the geysers, the wildlife. Folks assume it's all bison and bear encounters, lost hikers, that sort of thing. But what most don't know, what they never put in the tourist brochures, is that there are other things lurking out there, things that make a grizzly bear look as harmless as a chipmunk. I found that out firsthand on a sweltering day a few summers back. They sent me out with a rookie named Kira, fresh out of the academy and eager to prove herself. Mission was routine. Check out reports of illegal poachers near the park's eastern boundary. We set out before dawn, thinking we could hike a ways in, keep watch, and be back by nightfall. The air was thick up in those woods buzzing with mosquitoes and the smell of wet pine needles. Something about that area always set my teeth on edge. Even the birds seemed quieter up there. About a half mile in, we found the carcass, an elk, half devoured, the kill still fresh. Then we saw the prince. Too big for a wolf, too deep for a mountain lion. A chill ran down my spine. This wasn't a poacher we were dealing with, not the usual kind, anyway. Kira, she was still all by the book, bless her heart. Wanted to radio for backup, set up a perimeter. I knew that wouldn't be enough. Whatever made those tracks was big, strong, 
and smart enough to avoid our standard traps. If we were going to stop it, we had to go in deeper. We tracked the prints. They led us into a tangled ravine, a mess of fallen trees and overgrown vines. That's when the stench hit us, like rotten meat left out in the sun for weeks. My instincts were screaming at me to get the hell out of there, but Kira, she was determined. Said we had a duty to protect the park, to stop this creature, whatever it was. As we pushed further in, the ravine suddenly opened up into a clearing. And standing there, in the center, was the source of that awful smell. I'd seen some things in my years on the job, things that would send shivers down most folks' spines. But nothing, nothing prepared me for the sight of that creature. It was, it was like a man, if a man was twisted all wrong by some cruel design. Standing close to ten feet tall, covered in matted gray fur, with a hunched back that made its arms drag along the ground. Its head, that's the image that still haunts me at night. Long and narrow, with a muzzle that jutted out like a wolf's, only filled with far, far too many teeth. And the eyes, small, black beads, shining with a terrifying hunger and something else, a chilling intelligence. It turned its head towards us, sniffing the air, and let out a low, menacing growl. Kiara gasped, stumbling backwards. She raised her rifle, but her hands were shaking so badly I don't think she could have hit the side of a barn. The creature tensed, muscles rippling beneath its mangy fur. Had to think fast. I knew we couldn't outrun that thing, couldn't outshoot it. Go! I yelled at Kira. Run! Don't look back! I didn't need to tell her twice. She sprinted back towards the ravine, the dry leaves crunching beneath her boots. Smart girl knew she didn't stand a chance in a one-on-one -on -one against that monster. But now it had me in its sights. The creature lumbered forward, moving with surprising speed for its size. I fired my rifle, more to distract it, by myself a few precious seconds than with any hope of stopping it. The bullet smacked into its thick hide. It flinched but kept coming, a look of pure fury contorting its monstrous features. I flung the useless rifle aside and reached for my knife. Not the best weapon against a creature like that, but it was all I had. The thing closed in, the stink of its breath washing over me. I braced myself, waiting for the impact, the crushing blow, the shark, searing pain. That's when a blur of brown fur shot past, slamming into the creature. I whirled around, scarcely believing my eyes. A wolf, a huge damn wolf, had leapt out of nowhere and latched itself onto the creature's leg. The wolf snapped and snarled, tearing at the creature's flesh. The creature roared in rage, swiping at the wolf with one of its massive claws. The wolf yelped and went rolling, but it had bought me a split second. Using that brief distraction, I scrambled backwards, searching frantically for some kind of advantage. A fallen tree lay nearby, its branches thick and sturdy. Desperation fueled me. Grabbing a hold of one of those branches, I hefted it with a grunt. The creature was back on its feet, flinging the injured wolf aside like a rag doll. The poor thing lay whimpering in the dirt. Now the creature focused its attention back on me. It rushed me. I braced myself, and using all my strength, I swung the heavy branch like a baseball bat. It connected with the side of the creature's head, sending it stumbling. It let out a bellow that shook the ground, and spun toward me, eyes blazing. I didn't wait around for round two. I turned and ran. My legs pumped like pistons, fueled by a cocktail of adrenaline and terror. I didn't know where I was going, just away from that monster, away from the clearing. Behind me, I heard crashing and snarling. The creature was in pursuit. 
Each cracking twig, each gasping breath, felt like it'd be my last. The terrain wasn't doing me any favors. Roots twisted at my ankles, low-hanging branches clawed at my face. I stumbled and fell, sprawling onto the damp forest floor. A wave of despair crashed over me. This is where it ends, I thought. This is how the grizzled ranger finally goes, torn to shreds in this forgotten corner of the park. Then, echoing across the ravine, came a howl. Not the creature's, but a wolf's, a defiant cry. Suddenly, more howls joined in, a whole chorus rising from the surrounding woods. The pounding of paws grew louder, and I realized, in a surge of hope, that the injured wolf wasn't alone. A pack had answered its call. Scrambling to my feet, I pushed deeper into the trees. The crashing behind me sounded different, chaotic. Could the wolves actually be slowing the creature down? I didn't dare look back, just kept running, branches whipping my face. The sounds of pursuit began to fade. Maybe I'd gotten lucky. Maybe the pack had actually managed to drive that thing off, or at least distract it long enough for me to escape. But even that hope came with a grim realization. The wolves were out there now, agitated, on the hunt. The danger wasn't over, just different. Finally, I burst from the undergrowth, back onto familiar ground. Up ahead was the trailhead, a tantalizing strip of sunshine breaking through the heavy forest canopy. I sprinted across the clearing, not stopping until I skidded into the gravel of the parking lot. Then, and only then, I collapsed, gasping for breath. My body throbbed in protest. My clothes were a shredded mess, spattered with blood, some of it mine, some of it not. I stayed there on the ground for I don't know how long. The adrenaline began to fade, replaced by a bone-deep exhaustion. I should have radioed in immediately, but part of me, part of me was dreading it, dreading trying to explain what I had encountered. Eventually, I forced myself to stumble to my feet. My truck sat patiently where I'd left it, the normalcy of it jarring after what I'd just been through. I managed to patch through a call to dispatch, voice shaking told them my location, that there was an incident, a creature attack, multiple casualties. I left out the details, knowing they wouldn't believe me, not without proof. They sent in a whole team, armed to the teeth. They found Kira shaken but unhurt, not too far from where I'd last seen her. She was babbling about a monster, a nightmare vision of teeth and fur. I put it down to shock, knew she would never get the real image of that creature out of her head. They found the carcass of a wolf, too, torn apart savagely. And further up in the ravine, the clearing, there were traces of a struggle, blood, massive footprints that abruptly disappeared into the undergrowth. But no bodies, no sign of the creature I'd fought with. The higher-ups brushed the whole thing off as a wolf attack, Maybe a rabid one. Kira quit not long after. Can't say I blame her. I kept my mouth shut. Took the official reprimand, the sideways glances when folks thought I wasn't listening. Ranger Brooks sees things, they whispered. Better suited to telling campfire stories than patrolling a national park. Let them think that. Let them live in their comfortable world where the maps still have blank spaces, where the worst monsters are the human kind. I kept patrolling Yellowstone, kept venturing into those deep, shadowy places. Never saw that creature again, not exactly. But I started noticing things out of the corner of my eye, a flash of movement on a ridgeline, an unnatural silence falling over a section of the woods a strange musky scent on the wind. I began leaving offerings, scraps of food, a broken arrow, in spots where I sensed something lurking. A peace offering of sorts. Some call me crazy, maybe they're right. 
Maybe I snapped up there in that ravine, seeing things that weren't real. But I know what I saw. And I also know there are forces we barely understand at work in our wilderness. The wolves, they seem to understand it too. We got a sort of unspoken truce, me and them. We both know there are threats out there bigger than poachers, bigger than wayward bison. They watch over Yellowstone in their way, and I watch over it in mine. Nights are the worst. That's when the nightmares creep in, vivid replays of the clearing, the creature's fetid breath, Kira's terrified face. And I wonder, what did that creature want? Why was it there? Was it alone, or are there more of them out there? biding their time? I don't know, and in a way, maybe it's better that way. All I can do is my job, keep the balance as best I can. See, the folks visiting the geysers, snapping photos of the elk herds, they don't know the half of it. They see the beauty of Yellowstone, and that's a good thing. But beneath the surface, there's a wilder, more ancient heart beating. There's a hidden world right next to ours, full of things that defy easy names and explanations. And sometimes, sometimes those worlds collide. The drive went from road trip to nightmare somewhere along the desolate highways of Wyoming. This was my first big solo RV trip, a way to cope with the messy end to a long marriage, and honestly, it had been great so far. I'm Arden, by the way. Nice to meet you, considering the circumstances and all. Anyway, I took a tip from a kindly gas station attendant about a scenic spot off the beaten path. Said it was popular with locals, tucked away and serene by a little-known lake. It was beautiful. Aspen trees shimmered gold and the lake was like a giant mirror framed by snow-tipped mountains. I set up camp in a secluded clearing and even managed to catch a decent-sized trout for dinner. By the time the last embers died in my campfire, full darkness had settled. And that's when it hit me just how isolated I was up here. Silly, I know, but the night sounds were magnified. Rustling leaves, an owl's eerie hoot, even the tiny splash of a fish in the lake. I'm not usually a jumpy person, but the creeping unease had me triple-checking that my RV doors were locked. I woke with a jolt to a sound I can only describe as wrong. Like dry branches snapping, but close. Too close. My heart pounded in my chest. I peeked out the window. Moonlight throwing long, twisted shadows across the forest floor. Nothing. Yet I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. I tried to ignore it, chalk it up to my own nerves. Until I saw it, a flicker of movement just at the edge of the tree lean. My breath caught in my throat. It was just a silhouette. A tall, lanky figure, hunched over slightly but undeniably human. He was staring directly at my RV. Panic kicked in. Who was out here this far out? Why was he watching me? I scrambled for my phone on the nightstand nose signal. Figures. I had a small handgun for emergencies, but I didn't even know where the damn thing was. I took a shuddering breath, forcing myself to assess the situation. If I stayed in the RV, I was a sitting duck. But out in the open, he'd know exactly where I was. I had to at least try to get away. Easing the RV door open, I made a break for the nearest clump of trees. I heard him behind me, his footsteps strangely muffled on the soft soil, like they were barely there. He was closing in fast. I stumbled falling against the rough bark of a pine and scraping my knee. Pain shot through me. He was practically on me now, his raspy breathing echoing in the night. A hand reached out in the darkness, long fingers wrapping around my ankle. 
I kicked out, my scream tearing through the silence. He let out a hiss of pain, his grip loosening. My heart pounding, I scrambled to my feet. I had to get back to the RV, had to find my gun. I ran, blinded by tears and fear, branches whipping at my face. Reaching the clearing, I saw the silhouette standing directly in front of my RV. He had beaten me. Desperation fueled me. Then I saw a glint of metal beside the RV door. My fishing pole. I charged towards it, snatching it up and swinging it hard, the sturdy graphite tip connecting with a sickening thunk. He stumbled back, a surprised grunt escaping him. The fight wasn't over, but at least I had something, anything to defend myself with. He circled me warily, his eyes gleaming in the moonlight. They were wild, feral, not quite right. Just who or what was this guy? A twig snapped from behind me. I whipped around, my heart sinking. Another figure emerged from the trees. This one, bulkier, with coarse, matted hair. Had he been sneaking up on me this whole time? They began advancing, closing in from both sides. I was trapped. My mind raced. Did I try talking to them, reasoning with them? Would that even work? Could I take them both? There was a loud bang behind me and a burst of light split the darkness. A third man stepped into the clearing, older, dressed in worn hiking gear, holding a rifle. He shouted something at the two who were closing in on me. They froze, their attention now on him. You two leave the lady alone. His voice boomed, authoritative but with a slight tremor. Ain't right, stalking a person at night. The two men exchanged a glance. It was as though they shared some silent language. The first one, the lanky one, spat something in the dirt. Then they both turned, disappearing back into the woods with eerie silence. The old man lowered his rifle, a sigh escaping him. He approached me cautiously. You all right, ma'am? I couldn't catch my breath. I collapsed to the ground, fishing pole still in hand, my whole body trembling. My would-be rescuer approached cautiously. You all right, ma'am? Through shaky breaths, I managed a feeble. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Name's Wyatt, the man said, extending a weathered hand. Camp out near here, heard some yelling, figured I'd check it out. I accepted his help, standing on wobbly legs. He shone a flashlight around the clearing, then towards the woods. No sight of them now. Bunch of cowards preying on a woman alone. He shook his head in disgust. Who? My voice came out as a hoarse rasp. Who were they? Wyatt frowned. Hard to say. Couple of transients, likely. Drifting types set up camp out in the backwoods and tend to cause trouble. Could be they got the idea to rob you, saw you were alone. Or could be something else. His words sent a shiver down my spine. Something else? Like what? We walked back to my RV. It felt safe, solid after the terror of the woods. Wyatt insisted on staying until dawn, keeping watch outside while I tried to get some rest inside. Every creak, every rustle of leaves sent a surge of adrenaline through me. Sleep was impossible. The next morning, Wyatt helped me pack up my campsite. Best you get back to the main road, ma'am. Town's not too far, should be able to get a cell signal and call the sheriff. He gave me an assessing look. You look plumb done in after all that. Give yourself a hot meal and a motel room, rest up proper. I couldn't argue. He was right. I was barely holding it together. I thanked him profusely. But as I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I hadn't seen the last of those men. The way the lanky one looked at me before they left— 
It wasn't fear. It was more like disappointment. Like I'd escaped something, and they were merely biding their time. I followed Wyatt's advice, making it back to town by mid-afternoon. I called the sheriff, my voice shaking as I tried to recount the night's events. He seemed concerned, but assured me isolated incidents like this were unfortunately not uncommon. They'd send a patrol around the area, but with no real description of the men and no actual crime committed, not much they could do. I didn't feel any safer. In fact, I felt more exposed now, out in the open like this. I holed up in a cheap motel room, chain-locking the door and barricading it with a chair. Every time a car drove by, my heart pounded. I barely slept. The following day, I couldn't bear staying another night. I got on the road, heading back home, the comforting familiarity of my own city beckoning. But the unease lingered. I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see a battered old truck tailing me. As the days turned into weeks, the incident slowly receded in my mind. Sure, sometimes I'd hear a noise and my heart would race, but life eventually found its normal rhythm again. That is, until a few weeks ago. I was in a grocery store, and I glanced down an aisle, and I swear I saw him. The lanky one. Same wild eyes, same hunched posture. It couldn't be, he was probably miles away, but for a split second, I was frozen in terror. When I looked back, he was gone. I convinced myself it was just someone who looked similar, but I haven't been to that grocery store since. To this day, I don't know who those men were, what they wanted. Drifters? Something more sinister? Maybe I was foolish going off alone like that, but I also refused to let them win, to let them keep me living in fear. All I know is that somewhere out there in the vastness of this country, those men exist, and the idea that our paths might cross again chills me to the bone. I always thought silence in the forests of Shenandoah National Park was peaceful, a reprieve from my tumultuous past as a foster child bouncing from home to home. My name is Cassius Thorne. I work here, watching over nature's tranquility. This solitude was shattered one morning as I discovered the remnants of what looked like an animal attack, ribbons of clothing, a splatter trail vanishing into dense fog. However, no known predator in Virginia could inflict such harm. I radioed base the coordinates but got static. The weather was clear. There should have been no interference. I decided to glance around for signs of what transpired. The lack of answers unnerved me, but I had no clue how deep the rabbit hole went. As I searched... I stumbled upon a campsite littered with personal belongings and a journal belonging to someone named Juniper Black. It detailed mundane camping experiences until the previous page which abruptly ended with, It's watching me. No sign of Juniper or her companions. A crack of a branch snapped me to attention. There was nothing in sight, yet an oppressive sense that eyes were boring into my back gripped me. Deciding it best to return with backup, I headed back to my truck only to find the engine lines meticulously severed, a task requiring human-like precision and intellect. I hiked towards the nearest ranger station as dusk crept in. My training taught me not to panic. However, when one relies on routine and logic, unexplained phenomena tickle the edges of our reason. Under the waning light... Something moved in the peripherals of my vision, too large to be any native fauna. It matched nothing within my expertise. As night took its throne and darkness embraced me, movement rustled all around. My radio crackled suddenly with a voice that wasn't quite human nor electronic. 
guttural whispers that seemed both far away and intimately close. The forest continued its cacophony and felt alive with malice. Uncertain where safety lay but confident that remaining still guaranteed doom, I moved steadily toward where I calculated the station should be, using only memory as a guide in the enveloping blackness. Desperation clawed at me as I heard heavy footsteps following, a game of cat and mouse where I was prey. My heart was thunderous, an unwelcome companion matching step with those which hunted me when someone screamed, a howl of agony that froze my blood, a fellow ranger perhaps. The screams ceased abruptly as they started. Nothing was left but silence and murmuring trees. I reached for my firearm only to remember regulations prevented us from carrying unless extreme circumstances warranted. Those footsteps approached closer, never faltering. Suddenly through a break in the trees came hope. Lights from the station flickered dimly in the distance. Safety lay just beyond those walls. And then it darted across my path not ten feet ahead an abomination of twisted limbs and contorted features with eyes reflecting moonlight in predatory hunger. Panic surged within me. No time to call for help. The creature was on me. In my line of work, a split second mattered, and mine was running out. With no weapon, retreat was my only option. I sprinted towards the station lights, but the creature's pace was relentless. Thick with muscle, its limbs twisted in unnatural angles as it moved. Skin had a coarse texture, similar to that of an alligator but mottled gray and black like tree bark. It blended with the night. Its head was misshapen, jaw wide, bearing an array of serrated teeth gleamed in the dim light. Reaching the station, I slammed the door shut behind me, barricading it with anything in reach. There was no lock. The creature threw itself at the walls of our flimsy refuge. Windows shattered under its assault as it forced clawed fingers through the gaps seeking flesh. I grabbed the radio transmitter, my hands shaking uncontrollably, forced to abandon standard procedures because of this immediate threat to life. This is Ranger Station Delta calling an emergency. We need backup. Static hissed through the speaker after my plea for help ended. I repeated the message over and over again till a voice finally came through. Ranger Station Delta, this is Central Command. What is your emergency? Intruder. Non-human. It's attacking. A roar cut me short as the creature ripped through the barricades and lunged inside. The radio went silent in my hands as I dodged behind rows of equipment, the violent snarls following close. A colleague tried to fend it off, but brute force prevailed over his effort as he was knocked aside, limp body hitting the ground in ominous silence. It happened too fast to even see his face before he disappeared under thrashing limbs. Lights from reinforcing vehicles pierced through darkness outside just as claws closed around my arm. Flares shot into the air revealing its disturbing countenance seconds before an unbearable pain exploded through my shoulder. Dense matted hair covered parts of its body while other areas bore open sores that oozed with dark liquid blood spilled from my wound met the floor. Chaos ensued as rangers from backup teams rushed inside firing tranquilizers enough to bring down creatures thrice its size till it slumped in a heap just feet from me. Paramedics tended wounds while biologists questioned whether such a species existed or if it was some freak mutation gone horribly wrong from illegal experiments rumored in whispers among locals. Days blurred into each other during recovery. Officials reported nothing newsworthy except for an animal attack. There were hushed memorials for those who weren't lucky enough to evade death's grip. My colleague among them whose brave actions became a testament to his character despite nobody uttering his story aloud. In the end, there were no answers, 
only silently held vigils and tokens left at makeshift shrines that marked our silent acknowledgement. Something beyond comprehension had risen that night, something we weren't meant to understand or fight but merely survive and remember those who didn't. My name is Elias Kane, and this happened to me on October 12, 2009. Folks think I retired from the military and work security at some boring office park. The truth? Let's just say the things that give normal people nightmares are my job description. The incident, as the higher-ups call it, started with a missing person report in the Ozarks. Nothing new there. Hikers get lost, meth heads do stupid things in the woods, accidents happen. Except this time, the local sheriff found something, off. Half-eaten camper, tent shredded, blood in places it shouldn't be. And the kicker, three-toed footprints, massive, like nothing he'd ever seen. My team got deployed three days later. Five of us, me, Jackson, a weapons expert who could make a tank out of toothpicks, Torres, tracker with a nose like a bloodhound, Doc Martin, medic and skeptic, and Davis, tech guy, greener than grass. We went in heavy, loaded with enough firepower to take down a bear platoon and high-tech sensors that made my first tour look like the Stone Age. The Ozarks in autumn are beautiful if you ignore the gnawing feeling that something else is out there. We followed the trail left by the sheriff, the trees closing in like a cage. The first day turned up nothing but shredded foliage and the occasional, unnerving silence. That night, the woods came alive with sounds that sent shivers down my spine, rustling leaves, snaps of distant branches, and once, a low growl that made even Jackson turn white. Day two. Torres found another campsite, similarly trashed. Doc Martin, brave soul that he was, poked around the remains, calling out theories about rabid wildlife and mass hysteria. I saw the doubt flicker in his eyes, though, the way he avoided looking into the shadows of the forest. Night fell like a hammer. We set up a perimeter, night vision buzzing green in our eyes. Davis fiddled with the sensors, muttering about zero readings, when the air split with a shriek that could curdle blood. The tech went flying as something massive crashed through the trees, a blur of muscle and rage. I fired, followed by a chorus of gunshots and shouts. The ground shook under the creature's weight. It was built like a man, but twisted, skin tight over two sharp bones. Its eyes glowed amber in the darkness, filled with a savage hunger. It snarled, revealing rows of jagged teeth. Torres yelled, a spray of blood painting his face. He went down clutching his mangled leg. We dragged him back, firing blindly as the creature circled us. In the chaos, Davis fumbled with a grenade, the pin slipping out with a soft click. He swore and lunged for it. The last thing I saw of him was his desperate dive toward the hissing metal. Then the world exploded in white heat. The blast threw us back. My ears rang, my vision swam. Through the smoke, I saw the creature stagger, its roar choked off. Torres screamed, his ruined legs smoking where the shrapnel hit. Jackson swore and dragged me to my feet his face streaked with blood. Doc Martin was gone. I like to think it was quick. We ran. I don't remember much. The pounding of my heart, Torres' ragged breaths, the maddening rustle of something tracking us through the trees. Burst out of the forest at dawn, half dead and leaving a trail of blood straight to the creature's den. The brass were all over us within hours. Medical debriefings, the stern-faced men in suits asking questions, hinting at cover-ups. Torres lost his leg. Jackson got sent to some psych ward, 
never quite recovered. Me, they patched up and sent back to the shadows. Officially, the Ozark incident was a bear attack, freak accident. Davis, they said, was a casualty of friendly fire. The nightmares they can't sanitize, the way the silence of empty woods makes my skin crawl, that's a burden I bear alone. Some nights, I dream of going back. Not to kill the creature there's a line even I won't cross but to look it in the eye, to let it know we're still out here, still fighting. Even monsters have to fear something. A few short years ago, I spent some time down in the Everglades. Nothing like a swampy adventure to clear the head, am I right? That's what I thought, too. I'm Rory, by the way. I've always had that wanderlust thing, always needing to be somewhere new, see something different, even if that something different tries to rip my throat out. My plan was simple, just a few nights in that raised... Screened-in cabin they call a chicky out on the water. Fishing during the day, watching the gators glide by at night, maybe even wrestle one if I felt really brave. But Florida had other plans. Mother Nature always throws a curveball. I rented a canoe, loaded my gear, and set off down one of those narrow waterways that cut through the sawgrass. It felt surreal, all the green and brown tangled under that endless blue sky. Birds darted and buzzed around my head, and a fat dragonfly even landed on my hand for a second. I felt calm. A bit lonely, sure, but calm. Then came the smell. Like rotting meat left in the sun. I grimaced and looked around. Maybe a dead thing had drifted in and tangled up somewhere in the reeds. It stank bad enough to make your eyes water. I followed the scent, figuring I could deal with an animal carcass to put the stink to rest. The trail twisted and turned, the water getting shallower. Up ahead, something moved in the reeds. Not an alligator for sure, not that tall and gangly, but big. I stopped paddling. It was too far to see clearly, and with the stink... Whatever it was, I didn't want to get much closer. Then it turned. Folks, I've been around. I took a trip out west, saw a mountain lion in the distance. I've been in the ocean with sharks. None of that, and I mean none of it, prepared me for this. The thing was tall, too tall, and too lean, like it had grown fast and the muscle hadn't caught up. The skin hung in loose folds, pale and almost translucent in places. The head, that was worse. Small, too small for that big lanky body, and it seemed stretched, the face pulled long. The eyes were black pits, and its mouth was stained dark red. It didn't roar. Didn't make a sound. Just stared at me with those empty eyes, then turned and stalked off deeper into the reeds. I watched the grass ripple as it moved away, heard a cracking noise like bones snapping. Then it was gone, leaving only silence and that awful stink. Swamp ape. I blurted out loud, the old stories echoing in my head. But that thing, if folklore is accurate, swamp apes don't eat their prey. This thing feasted. Night fell quickly, as it does down there. My chicky, once a welcome sight, now felt flimsy and small. I sat with my back to the wood walls, a hunting knife in my fist. It didn't feel like enough. Sleep wouldn't come, my ears strained for the slightest rustle of grass, the snap of a twig. At dawn I fled. I paddled so hard my arms burned, and I never looked back. When I finally reached the ranger station— my story tumbled out in a panicked babble. The ranger, old Mike, didn't mock me. He just nodded, face grim. There's folks gone missing out there, he said, his voice low. Never find a trace of them. 
Whatever's doing it ain't natural. He paused. Maybe it's time folks believe the old stories again. I booked the next flight home. Some parts of the world, some things, are better left unseen. Don't get me wrong, I still itch for adventure. I just don't feel the need to be the main character of every horror story anymore. The Everglades taught me that. Months passed, and I tried to shake it off. But nightmares nod at my sleep. Every rustle in the night made me jump. I read every account I could find, legends of backwoods beasts, old tales nearly forgotten. That's when I stumbled across it. Not the swamp ape. Those stories seemed almost gentle now. No, what I found were the stories of the Wendigo. The twisted faces in the faded photographs mirrored what I'd seen. The lore, starving, insatiable, a creature born of hunger. Those disappearances in the Everglades that could have been it. They say that when famine grips the land, that's when it comes, and I've heard the rumors of drought lately. Maybe those old stories aren't just stories after all, their warnings whispered through the generations. A chill ran down my spine, not from the night air, but from something deeper. My swamp adventure hadn't ended in the Everglades, it was still here with me. Sometimes I hear it, a snapping sound at night, just outside my window. I keep my curtains drawn, the lights on. I keep the hunting knife near my bed now, and I try not to think too much about those empty, hungry eyes out there, just waiting. Sometimes, when the wind howls around my house, it almost sounds like a wail, a long, mournful cry carried by the night. The other day, a neighbor mentioned his cat was missing. They say cats can sense things we can't. I didn't say anything about what lurks unseen in the shadows. It wouldn't help. It wouldn't change anything. It's here now, and my Everglades adventure turned into a much, much longer story. A story with an ending I don't want to think about. My name is Caddick Harrington, and I like my coffee black. I was in the deep woods of the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. The area was so dense, it was challenging to see through the foliage even during the day. As part of an elite task force, our mission was to hunt monsters that lurked in the shadows. Legends had long whispered of a creature by a name none of us could recall. Hey, Caddick, my partner Silas Aldrich called to me over our walkie-talkies. How's your side of the creek? Dry as ever, I replied. I paused to catch my breath. The air was damp and heavy with moisture, making it difficult for me to breathe. I considered taking off my boots and wading into the creek, but then remembered why we were there. It wasn't time to slack off. We were investigating a series of gruesome killings that had rocked the nearby community. All of them had something eerily similar, an unsettling sense of brutality and gore. Unidentifiable body parts would appear in random places, leaving families heartbroken and detectives baffled. As darkness was setting upon us, Silas decided it wasn't wise for us to be separated, so he crossed over to my side of the creek. The victims, I discussed with Silas as we trekked onwards, haven't exhibited any sort of pattern. They come from all walks of life, professionals, teachers, students. It's terrifying, Silas chimed in agreement. Continuing our descent through thick brush and uneven terrain, we both started feeling uneasy. It felt as though the air around us had become thick with fear. That's when we found it a recently mauled body not far off the path. We radioed back to camp for backup without hesitating. Something was close by. As we stood there, the hairs on the back of our necks stood up in unison. Our senses sharpened, 
Our hands tightly gripped our flashlights and firearms. A low growl echoed through the trees, increasing in volume with each second. We immediately shifted into defensive positions, scanning the darkness for any sign of the beast. Remember, Silas, I said in hushed urgency. These things are fast and calculated, and with an appetite for human flesh. There was a rustle among the low-hanging branches to our right, and we both swung our lights in unison. In that moment, we spotted it, our target, a creature so horrifically grotesque that it defied all logic. Covered in coarse fur and standing upright on two legs like a man, its eyes had an unnatural glint to them as though filled with a perverse hunger. Suddenly lunging towards us at an alarming pace, we barely had time to react. Panic bubbled up inside me as I frantically raised my firearm and fired a barrage of shots into the oncoming monster. The creature approached with astonishing speed, and my shots only seemed to slow it down momentarily. Blood from its wounds spattered across my skin as it barreled toward me, determination evident in its gruesome features. Silas and I both knew that neither of us could combat this monster alone, so we both acted quickly and called for help through our radios. As the creature continued to advance, I fired another round at it, hoping to halt it long enough for backup to arrive. Popping sounds echoed around us as Silas added his own gunfire to mine. Yet, the creature appeared unfazed by our efforts. It continued to charge us with such force that my heart pounded in my chest. Suddenly, a surge of intense pain enveloped my shoulder as the creature struck me with one of its clawed limbs, sending me hurtling against the nearest tree trunk. With no time for a proper response, all I could do was scream in agony from the impact. Silas, realizing that he wouldn't be able to hold off this beast on his own, pleaded through our radio channels for immediate assistance. Fortunately, our distress signal had been heard. Reinforcements arrived just in time to witness the monstrous being racing after Silas. Trained professionals wasted no time in assessing the situation, and quickly began firing at the creature. Yet even as their bullets tore through its flesh, it barely faltered, still driven by an insatiable hunger. One particularly brave officer managed to position himself between Silas and the beast. Grabbing the creature's attention with a well-timed gunshot, he looted away from us and into a hailstorm of gunfire from his fellow officers. The creature fought relentlessly against their efforts but finally succumbed to its numerous injuries. Its once frenzied growls devolved into faint whimpers before ceasing altogether. With both relief and horror cutting through the air, the team wasted no time in containing the creature's battered, lifeless form. Knowing these attacks couldn't be ignored, they immediately pursued a full investigation. Upon closer examination, they discovered that the creature was just a deformed wolf, or at least they assumed so. It had facial features resembling that of a human, with a hunched posture and arms significantly longer than any wolf's should be. Its matted fur and twisted limbs made it appear alien, but there were enough similarities to assume its species' origin. The thought of such a monstrous aberration on the loose was chilling. Nevertheless, we all felt a sense of closure with its death. The team quickly went to work dissecting the creature to garner any possible information from its remains information that might prevent future incidents like this one. This mere fact did little to ease my mind considering how long an anomaly like this may have lived undetected in our small town. I sighed as I watched Silas being tended to by medics, knowing he would need intense therapy for both his physical and mental well-being in the coming months. But we had each other for support through such times. At the end of the day, we knew that our encounter with this beast would not only haunt us, but would also shape our resolve to help anyone who had ever encountered their own monster. 
As we departed from the site of our confrontation, I couldn't help but glance back at the carcass. One thought kept echoing in my mind. If such a mutation could occur in a seemingly ordinary wolf, what else hides in the shadows of our world unknown? I walked into the dusty convenience store on the edge of the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. The bell above the door jingled, announcing my arrival. I had recently moved back to the reservation, and I reveled in the familiarity of my surroundings. My name is Maka Wombly. It means, Eagle Soars. Maka, you're looking well, said Attic Tolik Samiktuk from behind the counter as I approached. Her smile was warm, but her eyes betrayed a sense of unease. The same goes for you, I replied. What's new around here? She hesitated before answering, as if weighing whether to tell me or not. Finally, she confided in me about several local incidents, mysterious disappearances and mutilated bodies found in the woods. As we talked, it became clearer that panic had begun to spread. People were desperate for answers and for help. I decided to step up and investigate. Upon leaving the store, I headed straight to the woods where the latest casualty had been discovered. It felt creepy and unnatural, different from these woods I knew so well. Darkness fell as I walked deeper into the forest, flashlight in hand. The waning moon cast shadows that seemed to dance menacingly among the trees. Broken branches littered a small clearing as if some struggle had occurred. In its center lay a butchered deer carcass untouched by scavengers. Its kill appeared meticulous and calculated, unusual for any predatory behavior I knew. I called upon Dinedashuni Abinakwenhleich, an elder who knew ancient stories and folklore passed down through generations relevant to our investigation. Over a cup of tea at his cabin, we discussed our situation surrounding the strange creature committing these heinous acts of murder. He recalled oral histories about shifting monstrosities hunting our ancestors long ago with deadly precision. Weaving through the related family trees, each generation faced a unique entity, with varied courses of action. It seemed as if the creature adapted its tactics to blend in seamlessly, calculated, I examined these past encounters and their responses, seeking a solution to bring our suffering community reprieve. However, the more I dug, the darker and more convoluted my outlook became. Aware of our rapidly worsening plight, Dianetashuni provided me with several protective amulets and blessings from ancient ceremonies aimed at warding off evil spirits but cautioned that they may not be sufficient to combat this adversary. Later that night, when several other reservation members agreed to search for further clues toward its whereabouts and victims, we were met with eerie silence and no signs of life that usually populated our nights. Although older residents nervously whispered scenarios fearing the Wichikoinjiing, pronounced Wichakeowingyen, meaning evil spirit, prophecy among ourselves, we kept our cool until we stumbled upon an abandoned car half-buried in brush with its driver door swung wide open. The car's owner had vanished along with their companion they picked up earlier that day without a trace. It was at this moment panic truly set in. We knew something malevolent lurked within our once safe territory. In frustration and desperation, I took matters into my own hands searching relentlessly for this enigmatic killer. As days turned into weeks, patterns began emerging in its hunting styles and the locations of each attack. It eerily felt like it understood these patterns itself aware of my investigation. With each discovery of an increasingly mutilated corpse in the woods despairing yet resolute, I began piecing together horrifying conclusions about this sinister creature responsible for the series of merciless deaths. Our tribe found solace and black humor dejectedly, 
like laughing at impending doom when pulling a prank on the cosmic chaos around us. One day, I stumbled upon a recent trail illuminated under flickering moonlight. Fresh human boot prints mingled with colossal distinct claw-like marks in the mud making my heart race and stomach churn. As I followed the tracks, the ominous outline of a colossal figure became visible at the edge of my flashlight's dimming beam. Calling out cautiously, my voice faltered upon registering something viscerally wrong about its silhouette. The outline of this creature, because that's what I surely believed it to be now, was enough to make me shudder. It stood on two legs, disproportionately long in proportion to the rest of its muscular body. Its arms were equally elongated, extending almost down to the ground with large clawed fingers that twitched and dragged through the dirt. I was overtaken by sheer terror as I frantically searched my mind for options. Calling for help would likely attract the creature's attention, leading to my immediate demise or, perhaps even worse, a slow and torturous death. Equally, I couldn't just stand there and do nothing. So I did the only thing that seemed viable. I ran. My breath came in ragged gasps as I sprinted through the oppressive woods, attempting to trace my way back to the tribe. Heaving branches aside with trembling hands, thorny bushes scratched at my skin as if trying to pull me back into the creature's clutches. I could hear it pursuing me, or so I thought, a low rumble resonating through its throat as it chased me down with unnatural speed despite its bulk. The creature didn't make any attempt at stealth as it crashed through the underbrush and snapped branches underfoot. Finally reaching the edge of our territory, I desperately shouted for help from anyone who would listen. Some members of our tribe immediately rushed outside at my cries, wielding whatever makeshift weapons they could find in their haste. Quick-tempered Jake charged ahead despite his fear while Sarah hesitated on a safe distance ready to help when needed, her guttural growls sending shivers down my spine. Gripping tightly onto a solid piece of firewood myself, every instinct told me we wouldn't stand a chance against this monstrosity. But what other choice did we have? In those final moments before our encounter with Doom itself, others joined us, friends and family with courage and determination etched upon their faces. We readied ourselves in a shaky line, eyes wide and hearts pounding. But as we all turned to face the creature, it was nowhere to be seen. The sounds of pursuit had stopped abruptly, replaced only by the unsettling silence of the woods. It was as if the creature had evaporated into thin air. With our tribe bewildered yet shaken, we had no option but to wait, and long days turned into longer nights as the creature never revealed itself. Some of us began to hope that it had retreated for good while others feared that it lurked nearby still, waiting for an opportune moment to strike again. When finally we dared venture back into the woods, we were met with a macabre scene, the not-too-distant corpse of another victim. With equal parts dread and sorrow, we carefully took note of the scene to better understand the seemingly invulnerable beast that terrorized us. Though it may have almost felt like a futile exercise in suffering, I knew that this newfound knowledge might help us find a way to protect ourselves from such a threat in the future. As we solemnly left the grisly scene behind us, I realized that perhaps our tribe's dark humor wasn't so dejected after all. It was merely a necessary coping mechanism in a world that had quickly become overrun by chaos and fear. Though we lost several more of our own to this wretched creature over time, part of me will always believe that it was thanks to our persistence and determination, and even our laughter, that we managed to hold on at all. Eventually, after exhausting seemingly every avenue, I realized that I could only speculate on the potential existence of other species living secretly among us. Creatures who may come dangerously close only to vanish mysteriously once more. 
In the end, despite every evidence of its trail leading directly into our path not long ago, it seemed we would never know the full capabilities of this evil spirit, nor could we ever truly prepare for the possibility of its devastating return. I was driving my truck down a dusty road in a remote area of Nevada, hauling a fresh load of goods that needed to be delivered the following morning. My name is Braden Quinn, and for as long as I can remember, driving had been my life. The open road and the freedom to roam wherever I pleased was something that I never took for granted. It was rare to come across something exciting on the job, but that's just the way I preferred it, or so I thought. In the distance, I could make out a lonesome figure limping alongside the road with a slight hunch. Curious and figuring that he might need some help, I slowed down my truck and pulled over. The man raised his head as I approached him. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was something unnerving about his appearance. His face appeared normal, albeit a bit dirty and disheveled like he'd been roughing it for days, if not weeks. Hey there, I called out from the cab of my truck. Need a ride? The man didn't respond, but continued limping towards me. Now it was clear what had been bothering me about him. His eyes were completely white, no pupils or irises, just like he'd seen something utterly horrifying. Unsure whether to help or keep my distance, I hesitated for a moment. As he reached me, he finally spoke up, in the form of a guttural groan emanating from deep within his throat while gripping at something inside his jacket. Perplexed by his demeanor and appearance, I decided to err on the side of caution. After all, I had learned over time that where there's smoke, there's fire. All right, then, I said before backing away cautiously. Have a good day. Continuing back onto the loose gravel in front of me, my wheels spun in protest, leaving a heavy cloud of dust in my wake. As I picked up speed, I kept my gaze fixed squarely on the rearview mirror. The man's pace had quickened, still clutching whatever he carried within his jacket, but it wasn't enough to keep up with the truck. Eventually, I lost sight of him. For the next couple of hours, everything appeared as normal as could be on the state highway that led back to civilization. Up ahead was a pit stop for weary travelers, one of those roadside diners that comes with a gas station and a small convenience store. Looking forward to grabbing a bite and recommending they send someone to check on the strange man from earlier, my conscience couldn't help but sigh. After fueling up my rig and getting a plate of greasy, heart-attack-inducing food, I walked into the diner to find myself some company. Sitting at a corner booth was an elderly farmer who was more than happy to lend his ear. Between mouthfuls of fried food and war stories from our respective pasts, I told him about my unnerving encounter with that man. Oh, you're lucky you got out of there, he said between sips of his hot black coffee. Heard rumors floating around that someone matching your description had been terrorizing people in these parts attacking folks without provocation. The seriousness behind the old man's eyes made me uneasy, but there wasn't much I could do until the authorities arrived. They were already fifty miles away after being contacted earlier when I called them from the road. As I continued eating and chatting away uneasily about anything other than the nameless stranger, we noticed an odd commotion outside followed by screams not too far off in the distance. I knew I had to do something, so I grabbed my phone and dialed 911. The operator picked up, and I quickly explained the situation, that a potentially dangerous man had been spotted near the highway, and I feared for my safety and that of others. While waiting for the police to arrive, the old farmer in the diner not only took interest in the commotion outside but also found a tire iron in his truck for some semblance of protection. He didn't want to take any chances with this mysterious individual on the loose. 
as he and several other patrons of the diner stood just inside the door, cautiously peering out at the chaos unfolding, someone spotted a figure approaching from the distance. It was that same man from before, his twisted face contorted in anger as he marched towards the diner. He wasn't carrying anything visibly harmful, but his intentions were palpable, and unease radiated from him, seeping into everyone who caught sight of him. Not wanting to take any needless risks, I ordered everyone to lock the doors and stay inside until help arrived. The stranger pounded on the windows and doors, demanding entry. Although he couldn't be seen holding any weapons, his movements were precise, as if he possessed a deadly knowledge that could inflict severe harm upon anyone who dared cross his path. Despite our defenses, there was something even more unnerving about him. It felt like danger was latched onto every step he took or every breath he drew, an aura of malevolence surrounding him like a shroud. Unable to force his way in, he then began terrorizing people outside, dragging one unlucky bystander across the ground by their hair before launching into a brutal assault that left onlookers frozen with sheer dread. As more victims fell prey to his seemingly unstoppable rampage outside, those inside could do little more than watch in horror through blood-stained windows and hope that help would arrive before they met the same fate. Thankfully, the sound of sirens grew closer by the second, and the stranger became aware of their approach. Recognizing that his time was running out, he suddenly sprinted away from the diner, disappearing into the nearby woods just as multiple police cruisers rolled up to the scene. The authorities quickly organized a search party to pursue the man through those looming trees but were ultimately unsuccessful in tracking him down. Despite their best efforts, he seemed to have vanished into thin air. In the aftermath of that horrifying ordeal, it felt like everyone, even those who didn't know each other personally, had suffered a collective loss. Years would pass with tales of that brutal attack echoing throughout our small community and never fading from memory. We mourn for those who had died or been injured at the hands of a maniac with no apparent reason or motive behind his senseless violence. As for me, I continued driving my truck across the country and returning home between journeys, a constant reminder of how perilously close I had come to falling victim to his rampage myself. Whenever I passed by that once-beloved roadside diner on my subsequent travels, I always felt a shiver down my spine, recalling the terror we all experienced there on that fateful day. I don't know if that demented figure will ever be caught or if his reign of terror is truly over, but one thing is for certain, he left an indelible mark upon us all. I remember that day like the back of my hand, not for any important event or appointment, but for what transpired in the shadows. My name's Ray Havisham, and I run a small shop in a remote area of Nevada. The region barely has a few scattered houses, but the tranquility usually outweighs the isolation. I was behind my counter when a couple of locals, Fred Spivak and Jenny Winthrop, walked in. They were chatting about some peculiar sights they'd seen near the caves down by Pine Creek. Ray, said Fred, barely containing a smile. You won't believe what we found, bones piled up high as a man's waist. Some critters taking a liking to them. Jenny chimed in, her eyes wide with exaggerated horror. Yeah, and there were these mad scratch marks all over like some big animalistic creature dragging its prey away. I raised an eyebrow and bit back a smirk. They were known to joke around, and given our isolated location, creative stories were our primary source of entertainment. You kids be careful out there. I cautioned them with mock sternness. A few days went by since my encounter with Fred and Jenny as I continued my quiet routine. During those days... I started noticing something odd about Baldy Mountain, 
strange skittering noises coming from its foothills near dusk. Shrugging it off as wandering wildlife, I buried myself in work once again. But then one evening, just after nightfall, I decided to investigate closer out of pure curiosity. As I ventured into the woods surrounding the mountain base, armed with nothing more than a small flashlight and my usual skepticism, the nocturnal rustlings grew louder and more extraordinary. A guttural growl echoed through the trees, chilling me to the bone. Freezing midstep with shaking hands clutching my flashlight tightly, I felt my skepticism melting away. With caution, I swept the beam over the area and spotted a pair of reflecting eyes in the darkness. The creature that emerged was nothing like anything I'd seen or heard of before. Its tall, lanky frame and elongated limbs sent shivers down my spine. The head, resembling a deer or stag skull, boasted sharp, menacing antlers that glinted ominously in the flashlight. The realization struck me like a ton of bricks. This was the monster Fred and Jenny had been joking about. I couldn't call for help, knowing full well it would only attract more attention to my vulnerable position. There was no chance of outrunning this thing either. My best bet was to stay as quiet and still as possible, praying it wouldn't catch sight of me. As luck would have it, a sudden gust caught my hat and blew it off my head smack dab into a bush not five feet away from the creature. It swung its monstrous gaze around towards me and our eyes locked for what felt like an eternity. Adrenaline thrummed through my veins as I clutched again at something useful to defend myself with. The creature stomped a bone-shattering step closer when another noise emerged out of left field, distracting it for one crucial moment. This was my opening to equip anything that could aid in escaping this dreadful situation. Seeing no alternative, I mustered every ounce of courage I possessed and heaved myself off the ground for a sprint back towards town, away from this eerie encounter I knew no one would believe if they hadn't witnessed it firsthand. The creature followed suit, its steel-like claws slashing the air mere inches from where I had been moments ago. I tore through the woods with abandon, knowing that a moment's hesitation could mean the difference between life and death. The creature let out another chilling growl, tauntingly close to where I'd been. I risked a glance over my shoulder, catching sight of its formidable silhouette as it effortlessly pursued me. With each labored breath, I could feel the creature's proximity, its presence evoking an indescribable dread. I had no choice but to continue running, my legs aching and lungs burning. The dense forest seemed to close in around me, but there was no time to contemplate the maze of trees I had to focus on escaping this monstrous pursuer. A nearby creek offered a sliver of hope for evading my tormentor. Splashing through the water, I hoped that doing so might muddle my scent. Reaching the opposite bank, I scrambled up and pressed on, resisting the urge to look back for any hint of pursuit. In my desperation, I stumbled into a small clearing within the woods. There were people there, locals with whom I was familiar, gathered around a roaring fire and drinking together. They held up their cups as an invitation for me to join them. Ignoring my initial desire to run straight past them, I realized that perhaps their numbers would provide some protection from the creature. Between heaving breaths, all I could manage were gasps of, Help! before collapsing in front of them. Glancing around at the shocked faces looking down at me, I suspected they thought me mad or drunk. The flickering flames illuminated terror across their faces when a gut-wrenching shriek split the air, an unsettling cacophony that combined bone-chilling rage with morning sorrow. Run! Someone screamed as chaos erupted within the group. Not wasting precious moments of confusion, we fled in every direction. With one last glance toward the clearing where brood death approached it dawned on me. My hat snagged in a bush on the other side of the creek would have reeked more like bait than an effective decoy. We regrouped further into the woods at least those of us who managed to evade capture. 
Time was not on our side. There was no doubt the creature would soon catch up. Lacking any weapons or tools, I felt helpless against this monstrous foe. I have an idea, whispered one of my neighbors, eyes darting about nervously. We'll race towards town and split into two groups. Hopefully it will confuse the beast, and at least some of us might make it back alive. Nodding in agreement, we prepared for the final sprint of our lives. With adrenaline coursing through our veins, we raced onward. The once familiar landscape transformed into an unrecognizable nightmare before my eyes. My heart constricted with panic, but there was no other choice. I could hear the creature crashing after us with vengeance. The moment to split up arrived, and we separated without hesitation. I could only pray that those in the other group would be safe from the creature's wrath. The shrill cries of pain and utter terror told me that our plan hadn't been entirely successful. The remaining survivors staggered into town as dawn began to break. There was no celebration upon making it. It had come at too great a cost. Our fellow townspeople stared in disbelief at our disheveled states and the stains of gore on our clothes. Despite many survivors providing detailed accounts of the horrific creature and its attacks, the incident's truth seemed unfathomable. Some believed our harrowing experience resulted from a mass hallucination or deception crafted by fear itself. Even now, as time passes and the dreadful memory begins to fade like a recurring nightmare, one undeniable fact remains— People lost their lives that night in those dark woods to a beast no reasonable explanation can account for something otherworldly with antlers that gleamed like daggers by moonlight. Many have attempted to understand what happened that fateful evening. Yet, in every way that matters, it remains an unsolvable enigma a ghastly tale passed down through generations as a grim reminder of the unidentifiable horrors that still lurk in these woods seemingly driven by an insatiable need for blood and ruin. This happened to me a few years ago. Not sure how long exactly, time gets slippery in memory, especially after something like that. Anyway, here's my story. My name's Orson. Friends call me Ori. It was just me and my cousin, Alara, up in the woods that weekend. I always love getting out of the city, just for a few days in the open air. It clears my head and all that, you know? Anyway, she's practically my sister, so a trip with her felt more like hanging out than some big vacation. We planned a simple RV trip in Olympic National Forest. It's one of the last big swaths of old growth on the west coast, a truly beautiful place. The trees seem to reach the sky, covered in thick carpets of moss. Always an adventure going up there. Well, this time turned out to be a little too real. This was around the fourth day. We found this secluded grove nestled between moss-covered boulders. Just off the side of the road, felt quiet and safe. Plus, it was level enough for the RV bonus. At our age, comfort matters more than roughing it in your average tent setup. Anyway, we're sitting out there, the sun dipping down with those streaks of color through the woods, breathtaking. Just chatting, enjoying the peace. That's when I see something move between the trees way off. Big thing too, probably six feet anyway stocky with dark matted hair. At first, I thought it was a bear, just ambling off like they do. So, we head inside the RV to be on the safe side. We make dinner, watch the sunset, the usual relaxing evening routine. At one point, though, a scratching sound starts around the door. Like nails on the paneling. Elara jumps. I do too if I'm honest. I peek out, don't see anything, and figure maybe it's a branch scraping from the wind. The night wears on, 
but that uneasy feeling doesn't leave me. Then we both hear noises again. Thuds against the side of the RV this time, something throwing its weight against it. This isn't the wind. Or a bear. Do you think, could it be? Alara trails off, voice shaking. We were always into Bigfoot folklore, sharing those silly documentaries over beers as a joke. Not so funny now. We both knew there weren't supposed to be any here, this far south. The reports were way up north in the Cascades. Still, that was the most logical explanation, even if it didn't quite make sense. Suddenly, there's a sharp sound, almost a metallic crack. We both duck into the corner, terrified. That's when the RV starts rocking back and forth violently. Whatever was out there wasn't just curious. It was trying to get in. The windows were small, thank God, but then a scream cuts through the night. It's Alara. She points wildly through one, voice high and tight. There, standing tall outside the window, bathed in the soft yellow of our RV lights, was a pair of huge, glowing red eyes. Even with the distance and light, the detail was shocking. I could see the thick muscles below matted dark fur, the huge hands on the sill, fingers as long as my forearm. Its face was mostly masked by shadow, but even then, I felt its predatory gaze piercing right through me. And then, nothing. Not even a rustle of leaves. It was like it simply vanished. Alara is crying hard now, whimpering through uneven breaths. In the silence after, all we can hear is the blood pounding in my ears. We have to go. Right now, I shout, jumping into the driver's seat and fumbling with the keys. It was a miracle that the RV even started. That thing could have trashed the engine as easy as looking at it. The thing didn't even attempt to slow us down. I floored it getting back on the road and not stopping until we hit the freeway. Elara didn't say a word the whole drive back. Neither did I. Eventually, we got to a gas station where she called the police. Told them all of it, the sounds, the eyes, everything. It felt ridiculous even hearing myself say it out loud. They checked our story, even drove us back to the spot. Found nothing, of course. We both swore off camping, at least up there anyway. Still get shivers thinking about those giant glowing eyes in the window. Even writing this gives me an uneasy feeling. Maybe those legends aren't so legendary after all. I moved to this rundown cabin on the outskirts of Gatlinburg, Tennessee back in 2018. Figured it was a good place to finally write that book I'd been dreaming about since I was a kid, you know, the whole tortured artist thing. And maybe the mountain air would clear the last of that nasty L.A. smog out of my system. The place itself was just what you'd expect, drafty, creaky with the added bonus of a family of raccoons that seemed to be having nightly raves in the attic. But hey, it was cheap and the views were amazing. Plus, after years of cramped, overpriced apartments, the isolation felt nice at first. A few months in, things started to feel off. I started hearing things at night. Footsteps outside the cabin, scratching sounds from the roof. At first, I chalked it up to the old house setting and maybe the occasional animal. But it just got worse. Sometimes I'd wake up to find things moved, a drawer slightly ajar or a book knocked off the shelf. Then there were the nights I swore I saw a flicker of movement just outside my window, but it was gone before I could be sure. One afternoon, I was hiking on the old mill trail, that winding path that snakes along the river. I loved that spot, always felt alone in the best way. But that day, 
I felt like I was being watched. It was a prickling feeling at the back of my neck. I kept turning, expecting to see another hiker, but no one was there. I told myself I was being paranoid, jumping at shadows, letting the loneliness play with my head. But that gut feeling, the sense that somehow everything was tilted just a little bit off, stuck with me. It all came to a head about a week later. I was in town for groceries, getting my usual supplies at the dinky little market. The lady at the counter, Trudy, bless her heart, was a fountain of local gossip. You hear about that fellow they found out on Roaring Fork? She clucked as she bagged my sad-looking carrots. I shrugged. No, what happened? Her eyes widened. Poor fellow up and disappeared a while back. Sheriff went searching after a few weeks, found him finally, what was left of him, at least. Her voice dropped to a whisper. They say it was an animal attack. I felt those words settle in my stomach like a cold stone. Animal attack. I knew, I just knew, it wasn't that simple. Back at the cabin, the silence suddenly felt heavy. I started barricading the door at night, the window shades always drawn. I couldn't shake the feeling, the certainty, that he was out there, watching me. Whoever he was. One night, I was working late. The words were finally flowing, the scene taking shape on the screen. Some ironic twist, maybe, given what I was going through. Suddenly, I heard it loud and clear, a knock at the back door. My heart leaped into my throat. There was no one out there. No friends dropping in unannounced, definitely not the mailman at this hour. Just dark woods teeming with, who knew what. The knocking came again, slow and deliberate. It echoed through the silent cabin. I couldn't bring myself to go check. After what felt like an eternity, it stopped. And then he started whistling. A low, tuneless whistle that made my skin crawl. I stayed huddled at my desk, not daring to turn, not daring to look out that window to see whoever was lurking in my backyard. Eventually, the whistling stopped. When I finally worked up the courage, hours later, to open the back door, there was nobody there. But I knew. He'd been toying with me. Things kept escalating. Stones thrown at my window at night. Tools going missing from the shed, showing up days later. And always, the footsteps circling the house. Sometimes I'd get brave, peek out a window, but never see him. He knew better, waited for me to fall asleep, for my guard to slip. I called the sheriff's office. Explained the noises, the missing things, my fear. Deputy whatever his name was sounded bored on the other end of the line. Probably kids messing around, ma'am. Not much else out your way. Yeah, those local teens were real into playing creepy mind games with the weird lady living alone in the woods. I hung up, feeling stupid and, more than anything, scared. I bought a lock for the bedroom door. Slept with my grandpa's old hunting knife under the pillow, silly as it seemed. Then yesterday I found it. Scrawled in what looked like dirt on the side window. A single word, run. That's when I knew something terrible was gonna happen. That knock on the door, those footsteps weren't just a threat anymore. They were a promise. I'm packing up my car now. Whatever that book was going to be, it ain't worth dying over. Gatlinburg never seemed quite right, but now I see I've only ever gotten half the picture. I just hope I'm getting out in time. I keep glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see him standing at the edge of the woods. Long, lean figure dressed in faded denim, his face swallowed by shadow.
This happened to me nine years ago, right before everything changed. I'm Zed Talbot, a forest worker in the wooded areas of western Maine. My days usually revolve around maintaining trails and observing wildlife. One morning, I met my co-worker, Eliseo Anderton. We were assigned to maintenance near remote parts of the woods. As we prepared our equipment, Eliseo joked about forgetting his lunch and having to rely on his foraging skills to survive the day. Our work went smoothly for most of the morning until we stumbled upon a gruesome sight at the edge of a clearing, a pile of human bones. We reported it immediately and waited for local authorities to arrive. When they finally showed up, they examined the remains and suspected that an animal might be responsible for the disturbing scene. With that idea in mind, we were tasked with accompanying two rangers, Hester Kinley and Griff Sterling, while they searched for potential threats. Of course, the job had started as just another day but had turned into something far more intense. On our way through thick foliage, Hester found an abandoned, dilapidated cabin hidden among the trees. Upon entry, Griff discovered a stack of old newspapers with headlines about missing persons in the area dating back decades. An ominous feeling settled over us as we stepped back outside. The tension was palpable as Griff shared stories about rarely seen big cats or bears that might be responsible for all these disappearances. He cautioned us about venturing too far from civilization. Predators tend to lurk where humans least expect them. We set up camp near a running stream when evening fell. The four of us sat together by the fire, listening to distant sounds echoing through the dark forest. Griff suggested some relief by sharing funny anecdotes of his childhood spent exploring Maine's wilderness. It was close to midnight when Hester interrupted our laughter with a concerned expression. She pointed towards an enormous shadow that seemed to emerge from the woods. At first, I thought it might be a trick of my eyes, but as the shape came closer, there was no mistaking its chilling reality. It towered well over eight feet tall, with long, wiry limbs draped in tattered fur. Its face was covered in pale skin tightly stretched over an elongated skull. With large eyes staring at us without blinking or acknowledging our fear, it appeared intent on advancing toward us. We leaped into action without hesitation, each grabbing our gear and sprinting off into the dark forest. From behind me, I heard the creature's heavy footsteps gaining on us. Amidst our panic, Griff yelled at us to stop abruptly. With seconds to collect ourselves, Griff instructed Hester to call for help while Ellie sailed, and I helped him uncover a net he had prepared for emergencies like this. We barely managed to set it up before the creature lunged at us. As it broke through the tree line, we triggered the net that trapped our pursuer momentarily. Griff nosedived for his bag and rummaged around until discovering two flare guns inside. Griff threw one of the flare guns to me and handed the other to Eliseo. As we aimed at the creature, Hester frantically dialed for help on her phone. Griff had no expectations of us hitting the creature directly, but he hoped that the flares would scare it away. We fired our flare guns at the creature in unison as it struggled against the net. The flares struck near it, igniting part of its fur. The intensity of the glaring flame sent it yelping back into the shadows, as we seized this opportunity to retreat further into the forest. As we caught our breath, Eliseo revealed that he, too, had seen such creatures before a community living just at the outskirts of a distant town. He wondered whether this was one of them, or if similar species existed elsewhere. On Hester's phone, we could hear a voice on speakerphone confirming that help was on its way. With our temporary safety secured, Eliseo explained more about his experience dealing with these enigmatic beings. It was several years ago, when he first encountered them in an isolated community located deep within an old forest. 
Their bodies resembled those of humans with certain primordial features exaggerated. They had developed their own culture and a seemingly primitive language spoken amongst themselves. Although not particularly hostile, they were highly territorial and would vigorously defend their territory whenever they perceived a threat. He proceeded to recount how their town had achieved an uneasy truce with this strange group by offering food and supplies as reluctant appeasement. As Eliseo finished his story, Hester received a message confirming help was minutes away. We anxiously awaited their arrival while simultaneously dreading any resurgence from our mysterious aggressor. As promised, headlights soon pierced through the darkness as a rescue team arrived on ATVs armed with high-caliber weapons and bright searchlights aimed into the forest depths. The leader approached us, introducing himself as Agent Turner. He explained that they specialized in dealing with unusual threats creatures like the one we encountered. He reassured us that their mission was to ensure our safety by neutralizing the creature. As we clung together amidst the night's eerie silence, we suddenly heard a familiar guttural snarl. The creature charged out from the shadows, its injuries only serving to amplify its rage. In a collective and coordinated effort, Agent Turner and his team opened fire on the beast. Their bullets punctured its body in bursts of gore and agony causing it to tumble back into the darkness. We knew it wasn't the end. We could now consider ourselves part of a broader conflict revolving around forces beyond our understanding. As we stumbled back into civilization, Eliseo blankly stared at a map of similar encampments dotted throughout the region, muttering and mulling over possible explanations. Over the next few days, we tried to piece together what had occurred during that harrowing night. Hester shared her traumatic experience with a close friend who worked in a research facility. Through her friend's connections, our story eventually reached an expert in cryptozoology who contacted us for further information. Haunting memories of clawed hands and gruesome snarls remained imprinted as I spoke with this specialist over countless hours recounting every detail of our encounter. Although no concrete answers were found about these enigmatic creatures' existence, our experiences helped shine a spotlight on an eerie unknown looming at humanity's boundaries. In the end, I can only ponder how deep this mystery extends how many other creatures lurk between cracks in reality or at the edges of human settlements and more concerning still what could provoke them to abandon their seclusion and begin encroaching upon our world? While Griff never returned to his adventurous stories around campfires in Maine's wilderness, Eliseo dedicated his life to uncovering the truth behind these creatures and their origins. As for Hester, she joined the cryptozoologist and began conducting her own research on the connection between these creatures and human history. And me I returned to my regular life, forever cautious of what could be hiding in dark forests just beyond the fringes of our world. I'm Officer Lyle Harrison, working in the small town of Stony Creek, Virginia. Some days, the job's just routine patrol and attending to minor incidents, like catching Dean Glatfelter jaywalking again. But today was different. A frantic call came over the radio from Tina Willick. She lived just outside town with her husband and two kids. The distress in her voice was apparent, but I assumed it'd be another domestic disturbance. Upon arrival, I knocked on their door. Tina opened it. A large bruise marked her cheekbone. Her eyes told me she would do anything to protect her kids, who cried behind her. Tina gasped for air between sobs and recounted how something had attacked their dog, a golden retriever named Bo. The scene in their backyard spoke volumes. Bo's lifeless body lay mangled in pieces, his fluffy fur drenched with blood. 
quickly surveying the area for clues, I spotted large bodily marks suggesting something uncommonly powerful had done this deed. Setting aside my skepticism in the face of Tina's wild local legends about terrifying creatures that stalked the woods nearby, I began investigating this harrowing event seriously. Throughout the day, more reports with similar patterns poured into the station, pets and animals found slaughtered within moments after vanishing from sight. This abnormal pattern worried me. Whoever or whatever this was needed to be confronted before taking a human life. Discussing with my partner Samantha Stalinsky about our mysterious assailant, we decided to cover more ground by splitting up to collect further evidence. Following muddy tracks down to Lake Mingog where wildlife often gather, I found myself keenly aware of my surroundings as twigs snapped underfoot and rustling leaves betrayed a tense atmosphere. Spotting a trail of blood close by felt like cold water running down my spine. Creeping further into the dim forest cautiously following blood spatters, I encountered Jennifer Lacefield, unfortunately too late. Her body was twisted and broken, gashed from head to toe. My heart collapsed in on itself. This thing had committed murder. Samantha arrived, her face contorted in confusion and terror as I filled her in on the scene. We resolved to hunt this creature down more intently than ever. It couldn't go on for one more day without endangering others. Leaving Jennifer's remains for backup units to investigate, we ventured into the wooded depths as night fell. I became convinced that whatever we were dealing with was not human nor like any animals we usually saw in Virginia's forests. A creature whose strength and ferocity remained unmatched now haunted us. Long after sunset, our flashlights became essential, casting inconsistent beams onto gnarled tree trunks and scattering shadows about nervously. Every crunch of leaves underfoot and snapping of twigs contributed to the mounting tension between Samantha and me. Dividing ourselves again to better locate our stealthy antagonist, my pulse raced whenever the hushed wind whistling through brisk leaves conjured imaginative hints of something sinister following me closely. Gradually, my flashlight started to dim. Fear threatened to consume me entirely trying unsuccessfully not to imagine monsters creeping behind trees with a twisted grin awaiting their next prey, like Jennifer, or transforming into something unthinkable, my apprehension continued to grow. Hearing a twig snap nearby, I froze into terrified silence. Had this beast crept upon us unannounced like it had done with its previous victims? Pointing my weakening flashlight at the noise's origin about fifteen yards away, I glimpsed for a brief moment that monstrous being stalking at the edge of my light beam, unnaturally powerful legs supporting an arched back sprawling with bony spikes running down its spine, rock-hard skin covered in spots resembling branches camouflaged against the dark woods, empty eyes that gleamed with malice like a predator about to devour its prey. Infinite panic welled up within my chest as it let out an otherworldly sound somewhere between a guttural snarl and a piercing metallic scream. A heavy footstep signaled it starting to move, so I aimed my firearm at that horrifying creature. But just as quickly as the vision had entered the light's reach, it slipped back into shadows saturated with obscurity. My heart pounded, and I sprinted away from the monstrous creature. Samantha followed close behind, her breathing heavy and desperate. In a last-ditch effort to save ourselves, I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, hoping to get help before it was too late. 911, what's your emergency? The operator asked tersely. There's a, a creature in the woods. It's chasing us. Please send help. I managed to choke out between breaths. My initial thoughts of this being an irrational fear slipped away as I listened to the operator try to make sense of my words. We need your location, she demanded, but before I could respond, 
Samantha tripped on an exposed tree root, sending her crashing to the ground. I doubled back and tried to pull her up, ignoring the pain that shot through my arms. Samantha grimaced with every movement. In that moment, I couldn't call for help without risking making more noise than we already had. Leave me, she insisted, a determined fire blazing in her eyes. You need to run. I hesitated but ultimately decided against leaving her defenseless against such an unknown predator. Working together, we managed to pull her up and hobble forward into the unforgiving woods. Continuing to evade our pursuer proved difficult as Samantha's stumble must have attracted its attention. We heard the creature charging toward us. Branches shattered under its powerful legs as it closed the distance between us quickly. Before we knew it, we could feel its hot breath on our necks. We stumbled into a clearing where moonlight momentarily illuminated our surroundings long enough for us to see a group of park rangers near their vehicle. A flicker of hope appeared within us as we screamed for their attention. The rangers quickly assessed the situation and ushered us into their truck while two of them bravely stood guard against this mysterious beast. As I stared at the rangers' stern faces, I knew they were grappling with the improbability of our situation. The truck sped away from the scene, and I attempted to explain our encounter, though my words barely made sense even to myself. It was like nothing we've ever seen, a terrifying creature that seemed to blend with the woods. One of the more experienced rangers nodded grimly, and then glanced at his colleague. Jerry, call it in. We've got a wildlife incident situation that needs documentation. Beyond exhausted, Samantha and I rested in the back seat as we felt safe for the first time since our horrifying ordeal began. The rangers contacted their headquarters and reported the incident with a strange mixture of disbelief and urgent concern. Upon reaching the ranger station, Samantha and I submitted our statements trying to recount every grisly detail of our narrow escape from such a menacing entity. As investigators started examining the area where we'd seen the creature, we couldn't shake away an unspoken dread. Days passed after our harrowing experience, and we learned that a search party had discovered grisly remnants of multiple unsolved missing person cases scattered throughout those dark, foreboding woods. Investigators struggled to make sense of this chilling new development as no known animal fit the description or exhibited behavior patterns like what we described. Our rescue by park rangers had been fortunate but also served as a somber reminder of those who hadn't made it out alive from this nightmarish predator. As we attempted to reclaim some semblance of normalcy in our lives— News broadcasts shared further discoveries about this enigmatic monster that now haunted many others besides ourselves. Ultimately, a consensus arose in which no one could determine what kind of creature had been responsible for those gruesome attacks. But every piece of evidence found pointed to something that defied all known classifications. Trying to put the haunting memories behind us, Samantha and I vowed to avoid the treacherous woods where our lives had been irrevocably altered. We knew that no matter the outcome of this investigation, any answers we might have sought remained hidden, locked away in the eerie, dark whispers of the forest that still echoed in our minds. It all began with a joke my partner, Percy Griswold, cracked as we sat in our idle patrol car. Why'd the old lady fall in the well? Percy asked. I don't know, I admitted, smirking. Because she didn't see that well. Percy burst out laughing. I, Officer Felix Johns, have been serving Warrensburg, New York for over twenty years. Being a cop in such a close-knit community has its perks. I know everyone on a first-name basis and feel connected to this small town, 
nestled between the Adirondack Mountains and the Hudson River. Little did I know that life was about to take an unexpected turn in Warrensburg, a picturesque landscape where nothing remotely horrifying ever occurs. Percy and I were patrolling the outskirts of Lake George when we received a call from dispatch. Apparently, a hiker had stumbled upon something unsettling just off the trail at Prospect Mountain. Upon arriving on the scene, we were met with gory devastation. A man lay face down in a pool of blood. It was evident his throat had been slashed open by something that looked like a razor-sharp blade. The sheer brutality of this ghastly scene was nothing short of paralyzing for our small town's police department. As investigations commenced, missing persons' cases from the surrounding areas began to pile up. Following fresh footprints from the murder site, the trail led us to an abandoned cabin deep within the woods around Buck Mountain. When we cautiously entered the dilapidated structure, there was an uneasy silence that made us feel uncomfortable at once. As we inspected the empty rooms inside, Percy broke into hesitant conversation just to fill the space. "'Did you hear about Lenny's bowling score last night?' he mumbled sheepishly. "'Percy,' I whispered through grit teeth as I noticed scratch marks gouging into one of the cabin floorboards. The marks seemed concentrated around an ominous trapdoor hidden in one corner. "'Need any help over there?' Percy asked as he approached suddenly serious. We hesitated before lifting that locked door. The bolt was rusty, but something was making a scrapping sound from beneath it. We exchanged glances and decided to call for backup. I radioed the station and requested additional units, which hastened towards the scene with sirens wailing in the woods. Before they had even arrived, all of us heard a terrifying ball echoing from the woods behind the cabin. Forgetting our previous apprehension, we rushed outside only to see a monstrous creature standing imposingly atop Buck Mountain. It had an elongated body, muscular limbs, and black eyes in a face that was both familiar and chillingly alien. The creature leaped down from its perch with frightening agility and attacked an officer who had just stepped out of his car. Its clawed hand clashed against his chest like a bullet, throwing him backward as several others started to open fire. As the gunshots rang out around us, this creature advanced upon its prey while showing no sign of wear or pain. It stalked quickly toward me yet displayed no interest in Percy who was desperately trying to clear his jammed pistol before becoming another casualty of this horrific night. Armed with my shotgun and sheer adrenaline coursing through my veins, I fired shot after shot at the abomination as it closed in on me. Each round made little impact on its grotesque form. With one swift motion, it grabbed Percy by the neck and crushed him with sickening ease. Subsequent bullets pummeled into its body as my fallen partner's lifeless eyes stared at me accusingly. I wish I could have done more for him. It was then that those black eyes locked onto me and charged forward with horrifying intent while I continued firing. In that moment, sweat dripping from my forehead, I knew I had no other option but to try and escape. As the creature lunged towards me, I dropped my now empty shotgun and sprinted back into the cabin with an overwhelming urge to survive. Inside, I quickly locked the door and radioed for more help, my voice quivering, trying desperately to explain the creature's deadly attack on Percy. The dispatcher assured me that additional units were on their way, urging me to stay inside and stay safe until they arrived. My legs trembled realizing that there was nowhere left to hide from this monstrous threat. Moments later, a deafening crash filled the cabin as the creature tore through the front door like paper. Splintered wood showered around me. Its unnatural roar pierced my ears. From what little was left of the once pristine door, I could see its sharp teeth bared in rage and saliva dripping from its open mouth. 
With no time for mourning Percy or thinking about anything else but survival, I made a run for the back door, narrowly avoiding the swipe and claw of the creature. Once outside, I stumbled upon an abandoned all-terrain vehicle, ATV, tucked away behind Jasper's cabin. Climbing onto it with haste and fumbling with the ignition keys left behind by chance or fate, I listened as a handful of officers arrived on scene just in time to provide some cover fire. The engine roared to life beneath me as bullets whizzed overhead. Officers screamed orders to others while some reloaded weapons in a vain attempt to halt the creature's advances. Amongst all this chaos and death, it was clear no one knew how to put this thing down or if they could at all. Refusing to waste any more time or resources, knowing full well that others could be killed by lingering any longer, I sped off onto the beaten forest trail. My heart pounded as I navigated through the dense woods on the ATV, convinced that the abomination was close behind. Every rustle of leaves and snapping twig heightened my fear, but, at that moment, all I could focus on was getting away from this nightmare. With a painful plunge, the ATV hit an unexpected ditch, tossing me clear off and onto the forest floor. My head spun from the impact as I struggled to regain my bearings. The officers who had arrived lay injured or worse back at the station, while others fought a seemingly unwinnable battle against something that defined nature. I pushed myself up with trembling arms, looking at my surroundings in hopes of finding a way to outrun this indefinable terror. That's when I noticed an abandoned mine up ahead, its entrance still dark and looming after years of disuse. Seeing no other options and unable to call for further help with no reception in these remote woods, I sprinted towards it. As I stumbled into the mine's damp darkness, I could hear the creature growling in frustration outside the entrance. Stumbling farther into the ancient tunnels, finding a dead end where once thriving miners had dug out their fortune, it became my only option to hide. Moments later, additional law enforcement arrived above ground but failed to find or kill the monstrous being preying upon all those within its reach. Injured and dehydrated after hours spent among the shadows of this hidden refuge, death began to feel like an inevitable release. Finally, overcome with exhaustion and thirst, I collapsed in that forsaken place and slipped into unconsciousness. When I awoke days later in a hospital bed, surrounded by bewildered staff and devastated families of those lost in that vile ordeal, it was clear that escape had been nothing short of miraculous. To this day, the creature has never been found or explained despite extensive research and numerous expeditions into those cursed woods. In the end, I could only assume that this otherworldly entity had merged into the shadows of Buck Mountain and lived there in twisted infamy, finding new victims and terrorizing the once peaceful area. Percy's lifeless eyes continued to haunt my dreams, a reminder of a past brimming with horror that refused to be forgotten. As I sat on the porch of my cabin, I couldn't help but recall the troubled past that had led me to seek refuge here. Life hadn't been easy, but this cabin in the woods of Oregon had become a safe haven where I could escape the chaos in my life. My name is Bartholomew Rinfleisch, and people often called me Bart. I spent my days walking through the tall trees and tending to the small garden that was starting to flourish. The peaceful sounds of nature were a welcome change from the noise and commotion of city life. One day, while out tending to my garden, I noticed something odd. My vegetable patch was trampled. Tracks led away from the destroyed plants and deeper into the woods. Curious about this disruption, I decided to investigate. As I followed the tracks, I discovered a scene that made my stomach drop. 
mangled remains of small animals littered among the plants and bushes. Whichever creature had done this left no trace other than the havoc it caused. I continued searching for clues in hopes of identifying the culprit. With increasing concern, I found several indistinct tracks leading to a nearby cave. The entrance was half concealed by vegetation. As cautiously as possible, I peered into the darkness. A low growl reverberated through the air, making me jump back in fear. Before me stood a hulking figure on all fours. Its fur was matted with blood and bits of flesh from its recent meals. The beast bared its teeth and emitted another guttural sound. My mind raced as I tried to understand what I was dealing with. This wasn't any of the natural predators living in these woods. It didn't even look like it belonged on earth. The creature stared at me intently but made no move to attack. It seemed intelligent, maybe even calculating much to my alarm. As it continued to watch me, I noticed a sickly sweet stench emanating from the cave and realized that there were likely more victims within its depths. The only person nearby who might be able to help was Mr. Peabody, the groundskeeper of a neighboring property. Given my fear and confusion upon discovering the creature, I didn't want to alert it, so I decided against calling for help. Instead, I slowly backed away and hurried home. I paced in my cabin, unsure of what to do next. Investigating further felt like a bad idea but neither did forgetting about my grim discovery. Resolving to seek help from someone more familiar with the area's wildlife, I went to find Mr. Peabody. Knocking on his door, I explained the situation as coherently as I could. He listened intently and then reached behind him for a worn, albeit very real, book of local legends. As we flipped through the pages, one particular illustration caught my eye an ancient creature combining elements of wolf and bear that locals believed lived deep within the forest caves. Was this monstrous beast responsible for the carnage I had discovered? That night, armed with flashlights and old hunting rifles from Peabody's shed, we ventured into the woods near my vegetable garden. The tracks led us back to the cave where I had encountered the terrifying creature earlier in the day. Our hearts pounded as we moved forward cautiously into encroaching darkness. The air inside grew colder and heavier with each step. I felt as though we were trespassing into something ancient and malevolent. We reached a chamber deep within the cave where fresh claw marks marred every surface. Bones crushed from previous victims laid everywhere producing an odor too horrible to describe. Suddenly... A guttural growl echoed through the chamber, and there it stood menacing with bloodied snarls the creature seemed prepared to defend its territory violently. In that heart-wrenching moment, I realized I had led us both into unimaginable danger. As the creature lunged toward us, we fired our rifles, but it seemed unaffected by the bullets. It grabbed Mr. Peabody with its powerful jaws and disappeared deeper into the cave leaving me horrified and helpless. With no other choice, I stumbled back towards the cave entrance, barely holding back my panic. As I did, I called out to Mr. Peabody again and again, hoping desperately for a response. The creature's growl echoed eerily, but there was no sign of him. Once outside the cave, I finally fumbled for my phone and called the police. Barely able to catch my breath, I explained what had happened, how Mr. Peabody and I had investigated the strange occurrences, how we had discovered the gruesome scene in the cave and confronted the monstrous creature, and finally, how it had attacked us and dragged Mr. Peabody deeper into its lair. The police arrived quickly with a heavily armed team to search the cave. Despite their firepower, they seemed just as uneasy as I had been when entering that dark place. They disappeared into the shadows in search of whatever attacked us. I anxiously paced near the entrance until an officer called out from within, 
they had found something. As I made my way deeper inside once more, my entire body trembled uncontrollably. In a small chamber off to one side of the main cavern, they had discovered a gruesome sight. Mr. Peabody lay bloody and lifeless on the cold ground. Although every instinct begged me not to look upon him in such a condition, I forced myself to approach his body to confirm that it was indeed my neighbor. Averted eyes full of sorrow met mine from every corner of that room. Either rescuers nor investigator could stand what they saw. The creature itself was nowhere to be found. With flashing camera bulbs illuminating every inch of the area surrounding where Mr. Peabody's life ended, evidence of the attack collected by silent officers muttering expressions of sympathy for him and his family. From there on out, our once quiet town turned into a breeding ground for fear. Stories circulated of the bloodthirsty creature that roamed our forests, snatching and killing anyone who dared venture too close to its cave. No one left their homes after dark. The entire town barred their doors and windows as if to keep the monster at bay. Despite extensive searches by local officials and independent hunters, no trace of the creature was ever found. Nor were there any clear answers as to what kind of animal could display such brutality. Wildlife experts had nothing to offer beyond wild speculations. Every encounter I had with people in town invariably turned into a retelling of that horrifying night in the cave or an interrogation as to how I alone survived. I could only repeat a truth I didn't understand myself, that somehow it had spared me in favor of pursuing Mr. Peabody. What kind of creature would do such a thing? Why? The questions tormented me endlessly. I couldn't escape them even in my dreams. With every passing day, the attack ceased, and a sense of normalcy returned, but the events were never forgotten. A memorial service was held for Mr. Peabody, with friends and family gathered to mourn and pay tribute to his bravery while facing an unimaginable horror. I couldn't help but feel wholly responsible for his death and I often found myself questioning whether or not there was something, anything, more that could have been done to save him. In time, life did move forward for me despite the lingering grief interwoven with daily routines. But every night when darkness swallowed the forest at the edge of my property, I knew that somewhere out there hid an ancient monster imbued with fury and a thirst for blood forever haunting not only my world but my dreams as well. And when silence enveloped our little town under stars shrouded by clouds, I glanced through my window towards that accursed cave in abject terror, remembering how Mr. Peabody, a kind-hearted man, had lost his life at the jaws of a nightmare made fleshy reality. To this day, I can still see Mr. Peabody's unshakable bravery and determination as we ventured into that ominous cave together. I woke up to the sound of birdsong, feeling a deep sense of peace. I had moved into this cabin deep in the Wisconsin woods, hoping for solitude and tranquility. My name's Ezekiel Bromley, recently divorced and looking for a new start. The fresh smell of nature filled my nostrils rather than city smog. As the days went by, I met occasional neighbors, Corinne Bigsby who lived nearby with her two children, Rowena and Kingdon. Friendly folks they were and loved to share homemade treats, such as spiced apple pies. Occasionally, we'd sit around together in evenings joking about life's absurdities or discussing obscure historical events. One day, while chopping wood near the edge of my property fence, I saw something strange through the trees, a distant figure that seemed to watch me intently. Rubbing my eyes, I tried to focus but the figure disappeared abruptly. Putting it down as a product of an overactive imagination— I continued with my chores. 
A week later, Corinne mentioned that people had been disappearing in the neighboring towns. Some attributed it to illicit activities involving drugs or gangs. Others whispered about something sinister lurking in the shadows. We shared our theories but ultimately dismissed them with nervous laughter. My life continued uneventfully at cabin for a couple months until one day while checking on a potential leak near a window. I found animal tracks leading from the tree line right up to the cabin wall followed by claw marks etched onto its exterior. Once again unnerved by these findings and those earlier incidents started weighing on me heavily as well. As days turned into weeks and night fell upon the forest and cast eerie shadows outside my windows, my instincts woke me up alerting me to some presence outside windows snapped shut on their own as if pushed by invisible hands. Wind rustled through branches as though some unseen creature was stalking among them. Discovering this hidden world lurking just out of sight wasn't my idea of solace. Sparking a fire on a particularly chilly night, I was alone with no companion save my hammering heart pounding at a rapid tempo. Not wishing to alarm others or raise panic, I chose not to call for help. Instead, I had to determine for myself the nature of these strange occurrences. Corinne had begun fortifying her home based on her fears about the disappeared people in neighboring towns. To my surprise, she'd bought several shotguns for her own protection. They're too much for deer, but you never know what else might be out there, she admitted as she showed them to me. I decided to arm myself with one of Corinne's newly purchased shotguns. The cabin once a sanctuary had turned into a menacing fortress. How quickly things change. My nocturnal intruder would not go away so easily and neither would the horrifying possibility that our local lore could be all too true. There might be a predator lurking within these woods an unexpected encounter between man and beast stirring deep within. Cautiously I set out into the night exploring the surrounding woods hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature or at least some indication that could lead me closer towards unveiling its true identity and nature. My eyes fell upon familiar tracks some meters into the tree line, following them further into the woods only for them only to become more bizarre and unpredictable, unmistakably detailed imprints leading me towards impossibility. In moonlight's cold embrace, I stumbled upon something altogether more shocking, fresh remnants from a gruesome altercation laid strewn before me bloodied clothes torn apart piece by piece belonging, I could not help but shudder, most likely to one unfortunate traveler consumed by whatever devilish machination roamed nearby. I had somehow spiraled into an unforeseen nightmare which was beyond comprehension, almost as if deliberately designed to trap my every dark, twisted thought, now on the edge of my own sanity." The sense of unease grew with each step I took deeper into the woods. The gnarled branches seemed to reach out, threatening to ensnare me. Despite my apprehension, I forced myself to press on, driven by a chilling curiosity that demanded answers. Upon spotting a cave up ahead, I approached with caution. The entrance was desecrated with scratch marks and traces of crimson staining the earth beneath. With each stop I took closer, the foul stench emanating from within intensified. As my flashlight's beam pierced the inky darkness within, my heart sunk. A pile of bones and tattered rags that were once clothing lay strewn on the moist cavern floor. The thought of Corinne waiting at the cabin, unaware of the danger lurking nearby, spurred me to action. Turning on my heel, I retraced my steps back towards her. Every instinct screamed at me to call for help, but in our remote location, there simply was none. We had decided to disconnect from civilization for a while and hadn't even cared for bringing a phone along. Once back at the cabin, I bolted the door shut and explained everything I had seen to an increasingly terrified Corinne. We agreed that we would have to leave come morning light. 
Remaining here for another moment would only put us at further risk. Sleep eluded both Corinne and me that night as we huddled on the floor with our backs pressed against the door. Our ears strained for any indication that the creature that had been terrorizing us was nearby. Then it came. A blood-curdling growl echoed outside followed by heavy footsteps encircling the cabin. The rickety walls shook between each pounding step until they finally stopped on our doorstep. Corinne stifled a gasp as heavy breathing reached our ears through the thin wooden door, the hinges creaking under an immense weight leaned against it. It knew we were there. For a fleeting moment, the creature moved, and the pressure on the door lessened. With trembling hands, I aimed the shotgun towards it, ready to strike. As soon as the creature rammed into the door once more, I pulled the trigger. A deafening blast reverberated through the cabin as splinters of wood flew in every direction. Unfortunately, I only succeeded in making a hole in the door. The growls turned to angered snarls as if mocking me for my futile attempt. It knew we were trapped and vulnerable. Mere seconds later, it forcefully collided against the weakened door one final time, ripping it off its hinges. Clearing away the dust, we finally got our first glimpse of our tormentor. An enormous bear stood on its hind legs, its matted fur dripping with blood and grime. This horrifying beast bore evidence of several injuries, some old and scarred, others fresh from my gunshot. Its unnaturally wide eyes locked onto Corinne and me, two helpless humans shivering on the floor, reflecting hatred combined with a primal hunger that sent shivers down my spine. Just as I thought all was lost and prepared to meet my end in this forsaken forest, another growl erupted from beyond our destroyed doorway. A second bear had appeared. Seemingly territorial or threatened by its fellow underrated combatant nearby, it lunged at our nightmarish aggressor. The two of them fought ferociously over prey disembowel each other with wild abandon. As they were distracted by their life-or-death battle among themselves, Corinne and I seized our opportunity. Heading out from the back window of our cabin abandoned all earthly possessions without a second glance. We ran for what felt like hours until we stumbled upon a nearby road just as dawn broke across the horizon. Hands on our knees red faces panting for breath took in all that had transpired in those few days. Ultimately, our vacation turned into a harrowing experience that we'd never forget. Grateful for our lives, we mourned the unknown traveler who had come to such a grisly end, their fate a chilling reminder of the fragility and fleeting nature of life itself. I pressed my face against the cool glass, my eyes scanning the swaying treetops. The radio crackled beside me, a reminder of civilization's distant hum. Yet, here in my tower perched upon the smoky mountain's rugged shoulders, I was a visitor to an older world. By day, it was all nature's tranquility. By night, an inky abyss. Three months performing this role and each evening held its own eerie calm. But tonight felt different, thicker air, barely a leaf fluttering. I'm Mercer Smith, and being a fire lookout was meant to be uneventful. That is until two nights ago, when radio channels erupted with frantic chatter about missing hikers. The local police Mabel Haskins, a woman known for her stern eye but kind heart, informed me about a suspect on the loose, a creature of flesh and blood, nothing more, just some feral man living off the grid they suspected had gone rogue after years of isolation. Tapping my pen against the logbook, I recorded nothing of note. That was until a rustle below caught my attention. My pulse spiked as the sound clawed closer, a shuffling gait through dry leaves, cunningly quiet yet undeniably present. I reached for my binoculars. 
Their lenses brought the forest into sharp contrast against the moonlit sky. Darting eyes caught no movement save for a shadow that seemed out of place. A figure? No, it was too big to be human. Steeled by routine checks and drills, I began descending from my perch to investigate when it should have been wiser to stay put. Each step on the creaking stairs tightened my stomach into knots. My name branded these woods as much as it did back in Albany where my ex-wife now barely remembered it whispered on her lips. At ground level, with only trees for company and no sign of the intruder, a chilling realization struck me. I was tracking this entity under its rules now. A chill ran up despite the lack of wind, not from fear but from understanding am I not prey when I'm sharing space with an unseen hunter? Jokes about missing socks or misplaced keys seemed lost in these woods where laughter didn't belong. Out here you had to find humor in gulps of fearless air or defiantly growling at shadows that weren't your own. All at once it felt as though every creature held its breath waiting for me to spot what they already knew lurked nearby. Through murky silence and crackle of underbrush, tension strung between trees like spider silk waiting to strike. Advancing with minimal sound myself, I spotted signs, an overturned stone here or there etched with marks that weren't natural erosion but something deliberate, a clue no doubt but leading where? A guttural snarl froze my footsteps, all senses strained now towards a point just beyond sight but definitely within reach if one were mindless enough to approach unarmed and alone. Years of service flare muted alarms inside me warning not to progress into what's both known and unknown at once. What compels us towards dark corners promising nothing but truths we're unprepared for? Suddenly air shuddered as though pressure all around decided on hasty departure leaving just you. And it, whatever it is exactly... This creature defined by absence rather than form looming between perception and reality's fragile divide. I retreated, each step measured, my attention sharpened to the threat that seemed to pulse with the forest's rhythm. I reached for my phone, fingers clumsy with haste. No signal. Isolation enveloped me more than ever, technology's lifeline severed by sheer remoteness a crack to my right. My gaze snapped toward the sound, eyes piercing the dimming light to catch fleeting movement, a hulking form concealed yet barely by foliage. Massive, the silhouette towered, shoulders broad and daunting. It moved with a predator's grace, every step calculated, muscles rolling beneath a mottled hide that whispered of cruelty and wildness untouched by civilization. Claws, dirt-stained and fearsome as daggers, dug into the earth, signs of power harnessed in sinew and bone. It unleashed a roar, an epithet that shook leaves from their branches, the sound guttural, primeval, a declaration of dominion over these woods. My legs gave way, not due to surrender but strategy, diving behind a down trunk just as those claws shredded the space I had occupied moments before. I crab-walked backward, boots pressing grooves into soft earth as I moved away. The creature stalked forward, its pace relentless, its intent clear in the narrowing of its ember-like eyes. A burly ranger emerged onto the path ahead, a rifle cradled in his arms a beacon of human resilience against nature's dark child. Get behind me, he barked. We edged away together, silence our unspoken covenant, broken only by twigs crushed underfoot and a creature's breasts that painted pictures of unyielding hunger. Safety found me under fluorescence at the station later. My statement spilled across paper like ink blots telling tales too ancient for urban life to decipher. Days passed no one ventured into those woods without caution's shadow as their follower. The creature claimed no victims from then on. Perhaps it lingered as a sentry watching from darkness. We never forgot, though, the nature's untamed heart beating within our own civilization's confines.
There I was, amidst towering pines and endless sky, a lone sentinel in my fire watchtower perched above the wild expanse of Idaho's untamed wilderness. My name, Arlen Sturgis, a name as unique as the solitary life I chose. The isolation didn't bother me. If anything, it was the vexing silence that served as my constant companion. I spent my evenings poring over books and letters from an estranged sister when days drew to a close. It was during one such night that it began, a distressing pattern that would soon crescendo into a series of harrowing events, ones that my practical mind struggled to comprehend even as they unfolded. The antagonist of my story wasn't some beast or phantasm. It was man, flesh and blood. Yet something about him was profoundly unsettling. He had been appearing on the outskirts of my vision at dusk, a figure that seemed almost animalistic in its movements, but carried a distinctly human silhouette. On this particular evening, I noticed an ominous glow in the distance. It seemed like a wildfire at first glance. Duty demanded I take a closer look. Grabbing my binoculars, what I saw etched itself into my memory with troubling clarity. It wasn't wildfire. It was a carpal skeleton of what had once been someone's home now aflame. Over the next few days, reports unraveled tales of gruesome findings— not just torched material possessions but annihilate lives left to smolder among ruined keepsakes. The local authorities named it arson. They enlisted me to be their eyes in the sky. Although every rational fiber of me detested vigilante justice, there was no denying the chilling anticipation that skulked in my gut. People spoke less and less around me down at the supply station where I'd stock up on provisions once every few weeks. Their conversations turned into hushed whispers pierced occasionally by laughter sounding far too estranged for any shared jest to be genuinely funny. That's when I met Daphne Keller, a strange woman who wheeled her way through life on an old motorcycle with mismatched saddlebags. There was no joking about with her. Her laughter came easy but always with a weight like she knew more than she ever let on. Every following encounter with this anonymous humanoid shadow played out like moments suspended in time, each one adding to an invisible burden I carried while awake and in dreams. The confrontation felt inevitable as the silent war waged on, each sighting brought him closer. Electric tension built up like static until one night everything felt surreal. The trees too still, the air too chilled despite summer's presence. In that breathless atmosphere, he reappeared with his backlit profile menacingly distinct against embers from distant fires I could not see nor understand signaling some ritual unknown to me. His silhouette held still against the backdrop of faint light, a stark contrast to the calm night. This time, he approached not as a figure shrouded in mystery but as corporeal terror. I stood rooted, my role as observer never meant to cross into confrontation. He moved forward, and the dim glow revealed his form long, matted fur covered his limbs and his eyes reflected a yellow gleam. Claws clicked on the hardened earth as he closed the distance between us. His bear-like size dwarfed my own stature but his movements were calculated and human-like. There was no doubt now. He knew of my surveillance duty. Each step was deliberate. Each breath I took seemed amplified in the leaves' silence. The station was miles away. My satellite phone lay useless inside the house. I understood then why Daphne's laughter carried weight. She too had seen him. I might have called for help, should have screamed into the night for any willing ear to hear. I did not. There lay an unwritten rule among those living on these frontiers. Some threats were to be faced alone lest they unravel into widespread panic. A sudden snap of twigs behind him had him turning fast faster than any creature ought to move. Daphne's motorcycle lights pierced through the trees. She charged at him without hesitation. 
her engine's roar slicing through the heavy air like a knife. In that chaos, she hit him with an impact that echoed violence and fear. There was no mistaking the clatter of bones upon impact or his enraged howls as he retaliated with forceful swipes that left gashes on her side, dark red against burnished leather. Torn between intervention and self-preservation, I backed away towards the house, knowing full well guns inside would prove futile against something so monstrous. It ended with Daphne still and our antagonist vanished into darkness deeper than any natural night could provide. Her final act managed to drive him away but at a cost too steep for mere words to recount. I called authorities not long after, their prompt arrival tinged with disbelief until they saw her beside her bike, life ebbing in steady crimson pools. They would say it was a rogue predator— animalistic instinct overtaking any hint of humanity at once possessed. Days turned into deep reflections over coffers at the supply station they spoke openly now about evils that bleed out beyond comprehension or capture, remembrance in lowered voices marked by curses towards cruel fates met, and survivors left haunted by their encounters with malevolence in fur and flesh. The once aflame skeletal home stood testament to terrors faced when vengeful flames licked walls and later when claws tore through lives seemingly at whim. I woke up to the deafening sound of my phone ringing. It was Vivian, my best friend since childhood. She sounded distressed, telling me that her cousin, Alaric Dalton, had gone missing in Mercyfield. The small town in Nevada was known for its dense forests and serene landscapes. Look, I know you're a private investigator now, and I thought you might want to check it out. I could use your help, she said with a shaky voice. Reluctantly, I agreed, unable to say no to Vivian. Soon after arriving in Mercyfield, I met with Vivian and a local sheriff, Jasper Kincaid. Sheriff Kincaid informed me that Alaric had last been seen walking into the forest on the outskirts of town while out camping with friends. As we walked deeper into the forest, we found what appeared to be Alaric's abandoned campsite. A torn backpack lay on the ground next to a partially consumed meal and a crushed tent. Carefully inspecting the area for clues, I noticed large claw marks on nearby trees and massive tracks on the ground leading even deeper into the woods. Vivian gasped as we stumbled upon traces of blood near the site. We need to find him quickly, I said, trying to remain calm but disturbed by the sight. As we followed the tracks further into the woods, the daylight began to fade, tree branches obstructing our view. Tension grew as we continued our search. In our desperation to find Alaric alive and well, we started calling out his name while wandering deeper into the dark forest. Suddenly we heard rustling in nearby bushes. We all froze in place. Jasper carefully drew his gun just as a deer leapt out and darted past us before disappearing again into darkness. Relieved but feeling edgy all at once, we continued examining these strange tracks when something caught my attention. I noticed that along with the inhuman claw marks on the trees, there were also signs of a struggle with human-sized handprints in the dirt. This observation sent shivers down my spine. As the sun set completely, a haunting full moon rose in the night sky casting eerie shadows over twisted branches and tall trees. We continued our search with flashlights in hand, discussing the possibility of a dangerous animal roaming about. Though I didn't want to jump to conclusions, I couldn't shake the feeling that something far more sinister than an ordinary beast was lurking in these forests. Suddenly, Jasper stopped dead in his tracks while holding up his hand for silence. We heard it too, heavy breathing nearby but out of view. Straining our ears to catch any further sounds, we held our breath, 
flashlights aimed at what appeared to be nothing but darkness. Without warning, a gut-wrenching scream pierced through the air. It was unmistakably Alaric's voice crying out for help. Adrenaline surged through my veins as we sprinted towards the source of his distress. As we drew closer, we discovered numerous lifeless bodies scattered on the ground around us, each displaying brutal injuries as though mauled by a wild beast while others were brutally eviscerated. What could have done this? stammered Vivian fearfully. Distraught and horrified, tears streamed down her cheeks. Jasper appeared pale and speechless. It was apparent he had never encountered something so gruesome and ill-explained during his time as a local sheriff. As we approached what sounded like Alaric's desperate cries for help rang out again, chilling us to the core because they were now accompanied by guttural growls emanating from something unseen lurking nearby. Terrified but determined to rescue him before whatever was responsible could claim another victim, we hurried towards Alaric's screams throbbing in our eardrums as if piercing our very souls. Moments later, we entered a large clearing amidst the otherwise impenetrable density of the woods. Moonlight drenched the area, providing just enough visibility to reveal the scene laid out before us. A monstrosity was towering over a bloodied Alaric, a massive humanoid creature, wolf-like in appearance with enormous claws and fangs bared menacingly. Fear gripped my heart as I looked upon this nightmarish creature that should not exist, each breath causing pain in my chest while air fought its way into my lungs. I glanced at Jasper and Vivian, their faces twisted with terror as they stared at the monstrous creature. Unable to shake the paralyzing fear, none of us could muster the presence of mind to call for help. We need to distract it. Jasper finally managed to whisper, staring at the beast as it loomed over Alaric, its massive claws ready to strike. If we can draw its attention away, maybe Alaric can get out of there. Vivian looked unsure but nodded. We knew that we couldn't just stand there while our friend faced this horrifying abomination alone. Jasper picked up a rock and hurled it towards the creature. It connected with a sickening thud. The creature roared in anger and turned its attention towards us, revealing thick matted hair covering its body and blood dripping from its fangs. What have I done? Jasper muttered under his breath as he began to panic. However, his actions bought Alaric some time. Crawling away from the beast in pain, Alaric made his way towards us. Run! I screamed at my friends as the monstrous wolf-like creature lunged towards us. We sprinted away from the clearing, desperately trying to put as much distance between ourselves and certain death as possible. As we stumbled through the dark forest, terrified and disoriented, we tried again to call for help, our previous fear now replaced by desperation. But there was no signal deep within these woods. No one would hear our pleas or come to our rescue but ourselves. We kept running for what felt like hours until we finally spotted a cabin hidden among the trees. Exhausted and wounded from our escape through the dense forest, we hobbled inside and locked the door behind us. The cabin's owner, an old man named Walter, came rushing down from upstairs after hearing our frantic entrance. We breathlessly told him about the terrible creature that had killed our friends and that we barely escaped with our lives. Walter listened silently, his face as pale as ours. He explained that he had once seen a similar creature many years ago. The experience was so horrifying he never dared speak of it for fear of people thinking him mad. He described a gruesome scene of blood and gore that had occurred when the beast had torn through some local livestock. It was only that very morning when he discovered the torn carcasses of his animals that he started to feel a deep sense of dread. As the old man described the grisly scene, something clicked in my mind. It's like a werewolf, I whispered, horrified by my own conclusion. 
We huddled together in the cabin, fearing for our lives, listening intently for any sign of the beast trying to get inside. Eventually, dawn came and cast away the darkness both outside and within our hearts. The creature seemed to have retreated, and we took this opportunity to leave Walter's cabin and race back towards town. When we reached civilization once again, we reported the deaths of our friends to the authorities. An extensive search was conducted in those woods but resulted in nothing more than shattered spirits. No one believed our story about the humanoid wolf-like creature that had slaughtered our companions. They suspected it to be a vicious animal attack or just some deranged person, but we knew better. We survived an encounter with a werewolf, and it would haunt our memories forevermore. In memory of those mercilessly slain, may they find peace beyond this world. I'm Bernard Thompson, a Parks and Wildlife Officer in Acadia National Park, Maine. Yesterday started normal. I laughed at a meme my sister texted me, but then it changed. We received an odd report. Two hikers went missing on their way to Jordan Pond. I alerted my partner Quincy Jennings, and we set out to investigate. The park was quiet save for the foggy whispers of distant birds. As Quincy and I checked the usual spots, we found personal belongings scattered throughout the trail, a backpack, water bottles. That's when we discovered something strange, drag marks leading off into the dense forest. We should call for backup, Quincy suggested. Not yet, I responded. Let's get more information so they don't think we're overreacting. We cautiously followed the trail when we stumbled upon a grisly sight, a torn tent and the clothes from our missing hikers splattered with blood. The fading sunlight illuminated every gruesome detail, making my stomach churn. Quincy nervously snapped photos before dialing for reinforcements. As we waited for help to arrive, I spoke about my family mentioning how they always emphasized preparedness during our weekend hikes in these woods. Soon after, four officers arrived, Isaac Howard, Lena Blackburn, Ron Weathers, and Lucy Monroe, each geared with firearms and supplies. Quincy briefed them on our findings before dividing into groups of three for security reasons. My team moved through the looming darkness methodically, staying alert as more trails of blood led us deeper into uncharted territories of the park. The silence was eerie, broken only by twigs snapping beneath trembling feet. Suddenly we stumbled upon mutilated remains strewn between clawed-up trees. It had to be one of our missing hikers. A humanoid wolf creature lurked nearby, a grotesque beast, not your ordinary wolf but larger and more sinister-looking. The thing growled from the deep shadows, bones crunching between its teeth. Our guns were aimed, but it dropped the remains and darted into the thick forest. We recoiled in terror. Isaac whispered, What the hell was that thing? None could answer, for the beast defied all known creatures of nature or any zoo-bound beasts. We radioed Quincy told him we found one body and just encountered something terrifying. Together, we resolved to resume our search for the other hiker. Determined but unnerved, we ventured forth as sweat dripped from our brows. The moonlight drenched the park in chilling blue and silvery hues, casting eerie shadows onto the rugged terrain. Quincy found a large rock stained with blood and drag marks leading toward a shadowy cave entrance. Wait, I said. Don't you think this is too obvious? Like it's a trap? Ron grimaced. We can't leave the other hiker hanging if he's still alive in there. We exchanged glances before Lena spoke up. Let's arm ourselves. With their hearts pounding as hard as mine, we inched towards the cave entrance, 
guns drawn and tension heavy in the air. The dark abyss swallowed us whole as we descended into its forsaken depths. The growls of that unfathomable creature reverberated throughout the cave walls like a deranged lullaby to our demise. Darkness clung to our faces like wet netting each exhaled breath tasting damp and foul with every step deeper into the gloom. As we ventured through the cave, the intensity of the growls grew, and so did my anxiety. Quincy suggested we split up and search the area more effectively. Ron and Lena hesitated but ultimately agreed. I walked down a narrower path, gripping my gun with white knuckles as I ventured deeper into the darkness. The growling seemed to surround me now as if it originated from within the walls of the cave. Suddenly I stumbled upon a gruesome scene. Ron laid in a crumpled heap on the ground, torn apart and drenched in blood. The horrifying knowledge that whatever brutalized him was lurking nearby spurred me to radio Quincy and Lena about his death. Scared witless but determined to continue our mission, we regrouped at Ron's body and pressed on in a single file. A guttural cry echoed through the cave which made us stop dead in our tracks. The moment of silence was shattered as something whizzed past us. Barely visible in the gloom, a humanoid wolf-like creature sharpened its teeth as it studied us. Its piercing yellow eyes locked onto ours. Fear coursed through my veins, forcing me to hold my ground. The creature lunged at Lena with lightning speed. Before anyone could react, she was pinned to the floor as it tore into her flesh with its razor-sharp claws. Panic set in as Quincy yanked me out of my stupor our priorities shifting from saving the hiker to survival. Run! Quincy yelled as we broke into a desperate sprint, hearts hammering wildly in our chests. Sounds of Lena's agonizing screams played like cruel music while she met her gruesome end. Grief weighed heavily upon us, but there was no time for remorse. Every moment spent mourning put our own lives at risk. We raced around a bend before crashing against a dead end. Panic and despair consumed me until Quincy noticed a small opening that we managed to squeeze through. We held our breath, listening to the heavy breathing and razor claws as they scraped against the rock walls drawing closer to the dead end. The creature stopped its pursuit for a moment before it let out a sickening howl. We stumbled upon a crevice leading to an opening above, Natural light spilled through the gap. We scrambled up to safety, hearts pounding agonizingly in our chests. Reeling from the trauma of losing our friends and the narrow escape from death's clutches, we walked towards civilization in silence. As we left disaster behind us, thoughts about what had happened weighed me down. The creature that attacked us seemed like a werewolf a humanoid wolf-like being that's unheard of outside folklore. Yet everything happened so realistically that ascribing it to tales was impossible. Quincy must have reached the same conclusion as his face wore an expression mirroring my own. We never called for help during the chaos because there was no time. It was primal instinct that drove us towards self-preservation urging our legs to run and hearts to race. Arriving at our vehicle, we shared a nod of understanding as we decided not to report the terrifying ordeal in detail. Nobody would believe us. It would only invite ridicule and scrutiny of our mental well-being. The cruel irony is that there is no trace of Lena or Ron's existence. They had died with no one to remember their gruesome ordeal except Quincy and me. We remained tight-lipped despite the guilt gnawing at our conscience, we knew we couldn't bring our departed friends back. Instinctively knowing what needs to be done is both a blessing and a curse, but this incident scarred me irrevocably with its unfathomable horror. Those horrifying yellow eyes haunt my thoughts every night as I close mine, a permanent reminder of the beast lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next prey.